We are live tonight right in the middle of all the action. Just moments from now, it's going down in that building behind us. A kickoff to the 2024 general election. With a speech delivered to an audience of Congress, cabinet members, Supreme Court justices, invited guests. And of course, millions of people like you watching at home with the state of our union divided. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. President Joe Biden, moments away from the most critical State of the Union address of his presidency. His message to the nation as the 2024 general election kicks off. Your freedom is on the ballot. With a rematch pretty much locked in. For the first time in more than a century, a former president taking on a current president. Joe, you're fired. The president set to lay it out as a clear and consequential choice, arguing it's either stability or chaos, democracy or tyranny. He's willing to sacrifice our democracy, put himself in power. And confronting head on his biggest political challenge, the idea he's too old to keep his job. I'm well-meaning and I'm an elderly man and I know what the hell I'm doing. On the issues, immigration and that border crisis. It's long past time to fix it. On the economy, how to make people feel better about numbers that are looking better. We're investing in America, and we're investing in American people. And with the wars overseas defining America's role in two brutal and deadly conflicts. Ukraine against Russia. Israel against Hamas. You can't walk away now. A speech with everything on the line. To rebuild the backbone of America. Just minutes away. From NBC News Now, a presidential State of the Union, live from Washington, here are Hallie Jackson and Tom Yamas. And good evening from Washington tonight, I'm Tom Yamas. And I'm Hallie Jackson, and in less than one hour from now, you will hear the president make his case that he's the one who can handle the big issues facing this country. And Hallie, for him, as you know, his biggest challenge, convincing America, pick me to lead, not Donald Trump. So let's take a look and see what's the top of mind of voters and a lot of you. We start with, of course, immigration and our southern border seeing a record-breaking 250,000 migrant crossings in December. Then there's the economy, because even with markets hitting record highs just today, inflation and unemployment moving in the right direction, the numbers looking better, people are not feeling better about their money. And foreign policy. The big news tonight, he'll announce plans to build a temporary port to deliver badly needed aid to the Gaza Strip. But the thing no policy, no executive action can change is also front and center tonight. His age, right, Hallie? That's right, Tom. Polling shows nearly three quarters of voters say he is just too old to be effective, including about half of his own party. And we know the president will nod to that tonight with a reference, although not by name, to former President Trump, his presumptive 2024 opponent who is in his late 70s. And there's a lot riding on tonight as well, right, as the president is set to walk into the Capitol with an approval rating hovering just in the high 30s. And he's stumbling or freezing could make things even worse. Because there's a lot of people watching. Right. There's a lot of eyeballs on this. Of the top 100 broadcasts with the most viewers last year, they were almost all football, except for the Oscars, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, and yes, Tom, the State of the Union. And just like Sunday Night Football, we've got tonight covered from every angle. Take a look from Mr. Biden's trip down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol, to the scenes inside, to the White House, where the president will depart from soon. And then here, let's pull this up full just right here, the one that says protest. A protest happening right now, a pro-Palestinian protest that erupted over the last few hours. For the next 60 minutes, we've got you covered with the absolute best reporters in the business, breaking down everything you're about to see and hear from the White House to the Capitol, from the border to overseas. But I want to start with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez posted up just outside the White House. And Gabe, we're getting a look at some of the president's speech. Give us a sense of what to expect tonight. Hi there, Hallie. Good evening. Well, before I get to that, you just showed those live pictures of the pro-Palestinian protesters outside the Capitol. You may be able to hear it. We're in a building near the White House. You can see it behind me. But down on the street, over the last uh, hour or so, there really has been uh, more than 100 pro-Palestinian protesters uh, that are here outside the White House, in addition to outside the Capitol. Now, Hallie, that really goes to show you the challenges that President Biden will be facing as he heads into the State of the Union address. Criticism, not just on domestic policy, but also foreign policy. Some of those protesters talking about how voting uncommitted sends quite a message. Of course, we've been seeing voters in the last several weeks writing, uh, writing in uncommitted. Now, I want to get to some of those ex excerpts, Hallie. Several different um, 
uh, themes that the president is expected to hit, the economy, also Roe v. Wade talking about abortion rights, and also the issue, taking the issue of age head on as he talks about protecting democracy. I want to throw up one of those uh, excerpts. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on the core values that have defined America, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor, and now some other people my age see a different story, an American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution. That is not me. Certainly, Hallie, the president planning to take several of those criticisms head on tonight. Gabe, as we were listening to your report there, we're also looking at live pictures of this pro-Palestinian protest that's happening just blocks from the Capitol tonight. And I think one of the things that's going to make a lot of news and a lot of people are going to be listening for tonight is what we heard earlier from our sources at the White House, that the president is expected to talk about this makeshift port they're going to build in Gaza. And Gabe, as you know, this is a sort of an interesting position for the U.S. We both help Israel when it comes to the military, and now we're going to build a port to help those Palestinians who are starving and need aid to get some help. Yeah, that's right, Tom. Look, the Biden administration has been walking that fine line since this war broke out, siding with Israel, but also trying to get as much humanitarian aid into Gaza. Now, yes, earlier today, we did hear from senior administration officials who told us that the U.S. military will now lead that emergency mission to create a port in the Mediterranean to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. The humanitarian aid will flow through Cyprus. But, Tom, there are a lot of questions logistically about how this will play out. The senior administration officials were quick to point out there will be no American boots on the ground in Gaza. However, uh, there are questions about logistics. The Israelis are set to provide security uh, for that mission, and then NGOs and the UN are set to distribute that aid once it gets into Gaza. But again, no American boots on the ground, and the senior administration officials say it will take several weeks to plan and execute that mission. But certainly it appears that the Biden administration is trying to show that it is doing something to appease those protesters you see right now. Tom? Gabe Gutierrez, a lot to watch tonight, of course, from your perch there just outside the White House. All right, let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles, who joins us live tonight from that exact location. Ryan, I, I want to go off script here just a little bit because we are watching these pictures of the protest here. I is it causing any sort of traffic jams, do we know? Is it preventing people from getting to the chambers? We know we're just less than an hour away from seeing the president hopefully depart from the White House and get over to the Capitol. Yeah, Tom, from my perch inside the building, it doesn't appear to be causing too much of a disruption. You know, most people that attend the State of the Union are well prepared to get here early because, of course, once the president makes his way from the White House down Pennsylvania Avenue, Avenue here to the Capitol, all those roads are shut off. Entrances are shut down as well. And so it doesn't appear to be preventing anyone who wanted to be here from the speech uh, from getting here in time. But as you point out rightly, that this is an issue that the president is going to be forced to deal with. He's going to be walking into a chamber that has been as partisan as it's been in a generation. And of course, that means serious divides between Republicans and Democrats. But there are also divides within the parties themselves. And there are a number of progressive Democrats that are concerned about the way that Israel is prosecuting this war. And there are concerns that there could be disruptions during this speech, maybe disruptions from Republicans who oppose the president's policies, but also from progressive Democrats or the guests that they invited to the speech here tonight who may want to voice their disapproval of that policy and the way the situation is being handled in the Middle East. But I can tell you uh, that there's already going to be a lot of ways for these members who aren't going to get the chance to speak tonight to voice how they feel about certain policy issues either in the way they dress or in the guests that they've invited here tonight. Among the guests, the families of the hostages and also the parents of Evan Gerskovich, of course, who is that Wall Street Journal reporter who's been detained by Russia. Tom and Hallie. Ryan, so much of this, right, so much of the guests, so much of who's in the chamber is about sending a message. It's about the optics of a night like tonight with so many millions of people expected to watch. Who else do you expect to see inside the chamber, inside the Capitol tonight? Well, let's first talk about that group of people that the speaker himself, Speaker Mike Johnson, has invited. And of that list, we already talked about the parents of Evan Gerskovich, but also a family of one of those hostages, the Neutra family. Uh, their son and brother, Omar, has been, uh, been held captive since October 7th. In fact, every single member 
uh, of the families of those six American hostages that are still being held in captivity will have some sort of a representative in the chamber here today. And I talked to a number of those hostage families uh, leading up to the speech, and they said that they really wanted the message to be that their situation transcends the political divide, that whether or not you agree with the way that Israel's prosecuted this war, uh, that, that you still should believe sincerely that these hostages should be brought home. So they want this to stay in the forefront, and that's part of why you're going to see them tonight in this crowd. Ryan Nobles live for us on Capitol Hill. Ryan, stand by. We're probably going to be coming back to you throughout the hour. He's heading into his seat. He's going to have that headset. He's going to be watching it all, talking us all through it as we start to see the cameras come up in just about looking at the clock, maybe 20, 30 minutes yeah. here. Let me bring in our congressional insiders, folks who know this building better than almost anybody. Molly Ball, senior political correspondent at The Wall Street Journal, and Eugene Scott, political reporter at Axios. It's good to be with both of you. So, Molly, give us a bit of a viewer's guide, right? Tom and I have laid out yeah. some of the big themes here, some of what the president has to do. I in order to try to meet the bar that he set for himself as we head into an election year. It is not a campaign speech, not technically. This has the apparatus of his being the commander in chief. What are you watching for? Hallie, I think your question stunned them. They're rendered speechless They're rendered from speechless. the brilliance okay. of that um, one. But you our viewers will notice all the commotion behind them. Yeah. It's a busy night here. We're in Washington. Always. State of the Union. It's sort of like the Super Bowl at times here in the nation's capital. And I'm sure we're going to talk to them, and we have them actually, I think, right now. What's interesting, too, I mean, to your point, you talk about the Super Bowl. This yeah. week, we are 48 hours off of Super Tuesday, Tom. Uh, I mean, and this is one where we now know Donald Trump is the presumptive Republican nominee, of course, after Nikki Haley dropped out, setting up the idea that this is 2024 politics beginning. The general election is starting this week. It's like two Super Bowls at once. And speaking of the former president, we know that, that he plans to partake in the festivities, not really doing counter-programming, but saying that he's going to— That's right. Fact check. He's going to do a play by play from Truth Social. Uh, it's one of the things we're going to be monitoring tonight as well. And I think we have Molly and Eugene back with us. So, Molly, uh, I, and I know you've had plenty of time to think about that. Uh, and in fact, we do have somebody else. We're going to go to Democratic Congressman from South Carolina, Jim Clyburn. We're going to take you inside that building you see there, inside that room. Congressman, it's good to be with you. I know it's a busy night. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. So listen, you said that last year's State of the Union was in some ways the kickoff to President Biden's re-election push. So maybe that makes tonight the start of the closing arguments. What do you think the headline of that argument should be tonight? What do you want to hear from the president? Well, I want to see the president draw the contrast between him and who seems to be going to be his opponent. The president, I believe, has demonstrated clearly that this country has been brought back uh, from the precipice. He has done what was necessary uh, to restore the confidence that the American people need to have in our government. He has rebuilt uh, our infrastructure or is rebuilding our infrastructure in a way that has been promised for years. In the previous administration, every week or month was infrastructure week or month, and we never got a single Infrastructure Day. Today, President Biden has given us the biggest infrastructure investment since Dwight Eisenhower. And those are the facts uh, that we have to get out to the American people. Healthcare uh, is at its lowest cost in decades. I believe that he has demonstrated that although uh, inflation uh, has been a problem, he is bringing it down. And we now hear the announcement today that we are going to see interest rates cut uh, at least uh, several times between now and November. Congressman so President Biden is doing what needs to be done, and the American people are beginning to tune into that. Okay. Congressman, you, you gave President Biden his Lazarus moment during the 2020 campaign. Uh, poll after poll shows he's having trouble with the American electorate right now, uh, specifically also with black voters. What, what happened to President Biden and, and black America? What, what would you advise him that he has to do better? Well, the, the black Americans are just like every other American. And you see those polls. It's not just black Americans that seem uh, to have lost faith. Everybody has had a problem. But we see it coming back now. I was amazed to see yesterday a new poll out that says Joe Biden is leading uh, in that particular poll. So we're going to go through this between now uh, and the elections. We're still in the primary season. And we are going to see us focus 
on this election uh, in the next several weeks. And I do believe that Joe Biden uh, will do well with the American people. Congressman, I have to ask you, you know, we, we've already talked on this broadcast tonight about the House Speaker warning his members that decorum should rule the day tonight, basically saying not to heckle. I'm looking, though, at some members of your party, particularly some of the progressives who have made clear that they are not happy with the way that the president is handling the Israel Hamas war. Even in this split screen moment we were just showing our audience, we're seeing those pro-Palestinian protests just outside the White House here. Are you worried that tonight the party divisions inside the Democratic Party are going to be very much on display to the millions of Americans tuning in? There will not be any heckling on our side of the aisle. I'll challenge anybody to can show me. Can you guarantee me. that? No, I can't guarantee it, but I can go on history. The history is very clear. You've never seen a Democrat on the floor of the House of Representatives yelling insults at the president, no matter how we may disagree with him. Okay. That is not the Democratic Party way of doing things. We may not like what the president is doing, we may not like what the Congress is doing, but we know one thing. My dad used to say, the first sign of a good education is good manners. And we are not going to go down that route, no matter how much we may disagree. Congressman Jim Clyburn, we're so glad to have you tonight. We'll get, let you get inside, get to your seat for everything beginning here in just the next couple of minutes. Thank you. And we have well, another special guest to bring in right now. Meet the press moderator, Kristen Welker. Kristen, uh, the temperature is hot tonight in D.C. You have this protest happening outside the Capitol. You have questions on whether Democrats, the president's own party, may heckle him inside the House gallery. I, I do want to ask you, is the president ready to meet this moment? Do we know? Well, we know that he's been working hard to try to meet this moment. He was preparing at Camp David over the weekend, and the White House and his aides understand the stakes. Tom and Hallie, I think you could argue this is the biggest, if not one of the biggest, yeah. speeches of his entire political career. Why he is going into tonight uh, fighting for re-election, the political fight of his life, and he's facing some serious headwinds, not just the war in the Middle East and frustration with his handling over that, but the fact that we are seeing the economy get better by the numbers, but that the vast majority of Americans say that they don't feel it. Mm. So he's got to make the case, here's what I'm going to do in a second term to make sure that you are feeling the impact of this. And then finally, he's going to draw this sharp contrast with former President Donald Trump. We know that. I don't anticipate He'll mention Trump by name. But in terms of being ready to meet the moment, you heard that reporting there, and you guys just said this, that the speaker has encouraged his conference yeah. to not jeer and shout out. But what if they do? There likely will be a little bit of jeering. I wouldn't be surprised for that. The conference just ousted his president. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's exactly. the question. Does Speaker Johnson have the muscle right now that they're going to listen to him? That's the question. Okay. I think that it was it was something that was delivered very seriously and sternly. I would be surprised if everyone listened right. to him. I do think the challenge for the president is to be prepared to respond and to make it feel authentic. Mm -hmm. We know he's been preparing to go toe to toe with Republicans who might shout some things out. But if it doesn't feel authentic, I think it could lose a little bit of the, the punch that he might want. Well, and that gets to something that is important about tonight, because the policy is going to be yes, there. There's going to be, yes. listen, you're going to get meat and potatoes, yes. right? That's what's going to happen. But it, to, in many ways, it's not just yeah. what the president says. It's how he says it. And you look at the, the speech that we watched together just a couple of nights ago. ago former President Trump coming yes. out on Super Tuesday, yes. essentially taking on the mantle of becoming the presumptive Republican nominee. And one of our colleagues, I think it was Garrett Haig, described that speech as perhaps decaffeinated Donald yeah. Trump. <laughs> yeah. Joe Biden, exactly. President Biden has got to come out, right, and, and, and show that he has some energy, show that he can That's combat right. some of those concerns. Talk us through that piece. That's right, because if you look at the polls, more than 70% of Americans say they have real concerns about his age and his ability to serve another four years. He's got to answer those concerns tonight. He's got to be forceful if you talk to his allies, and he's got to have a, a, a caffeinated performance tonight, and one that feels energized and like he's ready to take on the task of another four years. And I was talking to a couple of outside advisors who said, look, he can't just deliver a list of accomplishments and goals, it's got to be a story. There's got to be an it arc. It always is a it's story, right? Gotta they point be to the, the guests in the right. box. But, he, but he's got to really make you feel it. That's what he 
did last time, by the way. I think he was broadly praised as having delivered a strong speech. He's got to do it again. And the question is, will he be And he took on the hecklers. And, and I'm sure That's they've right. prepped him this time for that as well. We'll see what happens. Kristen, we great will. to have you. We look forward great to more to of your coverage both. later Thank in the you. night. Thank you. Joining us now, I want to bring in somebody who's going to have a front row seat, perhaps not literally, but figuratively to this, Republican congressman from Minnesota and Majority Whip, Tom Emmer. Congressman, thank you so much for making the time for us before you have to head in. I appreciate it. Great to be with you, Hallie, Tom. Thank you. So listen, one of the topics that we know is going to be front and center for Republicans, certainly, is immigration. And you've been a critic of President Biden's border policies. You've written on X that he could secure our borders today with the stroke of a pen. It is Republicans, of course, who tanked that bipartisan bill that would have given more power to the government when it comes to immigration and border security. So when the president inevitably brings that up tonight, sir, and we know that he is likely to do so, what is the GOP defense to that? Well, the first uh, thing I, I need to tell you is that the uh, president has signed 64 executive orders since he took office, Sally, and those 64 executive orders have effectively undone the work that the previous administration did to seal the border. As a result, you've had 8.7 million uh, illegals come across our borders uh, in just the last three years, and with gotaways, that number's even higher. When you talk about uh, the bill that was in the Senate, I, I mean, let's uh, uh, talk about the uh, fact that it couldn't even get cloture on the Senate floor. It didn't go anywhere. The House provided uh, the Senate and uh, the White House with, if you are not going to undo your, uh, your 64 executive orders, if you're not going to do what you could do yesterday to fix our problem at the border, uh, then there are five things, five core things that Republicans suggested as early as last May. One, finish the wall. Two, reform the parole, president's parole authority. Three, uh, uh, reform our broken asylum system. Uh, four is uh, end catch and release, and five is restore uh, uh, the Remain in Mexico policy, which our Custom and Border Patrol Cong says would staunch the flow by 70 percent. That Senate bill, Hallie, that Senate bill didn't have any of that and, in fact, codified the catch and release, the illegal catch and release that this administration is doing at the southern border right now. Was any of the pushback because former President Trump made clear to your conference that he didn't want to see this go through in an election year? President Trump's been talking about the border since 2014 or 15 when he started running the first time. No, the uh, House Republican Conference, okay. uh, this is where we have been. And keep in mind, those five things that I just gave you, they were delivered to Chuck Schumer uh, last May. And he has refused to do anything about it. And so the only thing we're left with is, Mr. President, if you're sincere about sealing the border, undo your 64 okay. executive orders and do the job. Congressman, President Biden will be speaking to House Republicans, including some who are actively trying to impeach him. You've said your conference should follow the facts wherever they lead, and so far investigations from multiple committees have not produced evidence of high crimes or misdemeanors against the president as of yet. As a member of leadership, do you think it's time to finally put your members' impeachment push to bed? Uh, you can call it what you want, but the House has the obligation to do oversight of the executive branch. I, I know the, uh, the journalism world wants to jump to the impeachment word every time, but our job is to follow the facts. I think uh, uh, Jim Jordan, I think uh, Jamie Comer, I think uh, 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 Smith, Jason Smith from Missouri, they've all been doing exactly that. Let's, uh, let's find out what all the facts are. Let's see what we have. If nothing else, the but American people need to know yeah. if someone is actually selling their name or their relative's name for uh, uh, financial gains. So and I totally appreciate that. Whether that rises that. Think, to that level or not, yeah, we'll see. And I think you're right, though, but I, what would you tell the American people? What has the House uncovered in all this time that hasn't already been reported out? Well, I think that's been widely reported. Bottom line is, I'm going to tell you again, Tom, it is our job to make sure we are doing the oversight of the executive branch and making sure that everything is transparent and out in the public, and I think our guys have been doing that very well. Congressman, before we let you go, we've been talking about the possibility of some of these unpredictable moments from folks who are in the chamber tonight. We know what the House Speaker has told members of your conference. Do you expect that they will respect the decorum directive, as you might want to call it, that the Speaker put down? Well, I know that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, Democrats, have been known to wear special uniforms, stand up and turn their back to the person speaking at the podium. I don't expect to see any of that tonight. But look, I can only control myself, and I plan to sit and listen uh, very carefully to what the president has to say. Congressman, thank you so much for making the time for us on what is a big and busy night for everybody in Washington. Appreciate it.
Thank you, guys. And we told you tonight the president will probably hit on two big issues voters will focus on in November, the economy and immigration. Julia Ainsley is in the key border state of Texas tonight, but I want to start with Christine Romans, who is joining us here in Washington, keeping an eye on all things economy. And Christine, I know that you had a chance to catch up with White House officials looking ahead to what we expect to hear from the president. We got a bit of a taste of it in some of those excerpts that have just been released in the last couple of hours here, that he's looking to show that the economy can grow from the, from the middle and the bottom up and not the top down. Absolutely. And he wants to show the American people or the plan is to frame it all really as he's working to lower costs for you because people are still quite scarred by inflation, the inflation story of the past three years, even as all of the other big economic numbers are really strong, even as the stock market hits record highs, even as, as GDP continues uh, to grow and that much forecast recession last year never happened, people still feel pretty skittish about the economy. So the president's plan is to try to meet people at their kitchen table and show that he is trying to cut costs everywhere. Way he can and trying to control corporate America into, uh, you know, getting rid of those hidden fees and junk fees, as the White House likes to talk about it. Also, you'll hear him talking a lot about tax fairness, raising taxes on mega corporations, on people who make $100 million uh, or more, but never raising taxes on people who make less than $400,000 a year. So I think those are the two ways that he's going to try to frame that economy story tonight, you guys. Christine, you know, it's, it's interesting in politics because sometimes when the stock market is down, whatever political parties in power will say the stock market, that's not the economy. But when the stock market is roaring, then those same politicians will say, hey, look at the stock market. Is it a gamble for President Biden and Democrats to talk about the stock market right now because you just don't know where it'll be in November? Yeah, and I don't think you'll hear him say much about it. If maybe mm -hmm. a brief mention, he's going to talk about prices and how he's trying to lower prices for American families. These little granular things that drive families crazy and add to their, to their costs, he's going to try to meet them at the kitchen table, not on Wall Street. Christine Romans, thank you so much. Glad you're here with us in D.C. tonight. Yeah, I love having you. I'm joined now by Republican Congressman of Texas, Tony Gonzalez. Congressman, thank you for joining us on such a busy night. Um, I, I just want you to speak very directly to our viewers. I know you are a Republican, but at times you've been ostracized by your own party. If you can be as frank as possible with us, how bad do you see the border situation right now in the United States? It is so bad. That, first off, thanks for having mm -hmm. me, Tom. It is so bad that people have given up. They've given up on the president. They've stopped listening to what he had to say. They no longer trust the federal government. People feel abandoned. That's not Republicans. That's not Democrats. That's people along the border feel abandoned. I think more and more people across the country feel unsafe. And that is one of the things that is driving this. This border crisis absolutely has a nexus into this security issue that we're seeing all throughout the country. It's as bad as I've ever seen it. Over 7,000 people coming over a day, but most importantly, people feel abandoned and they've given up. There's another issue we expect the president to talk about, of course, and that is the wars overseas. You are one of the more pro-Ukraine House Republicans. You know, this is a, put, puts you at a lockstep with your party. I don't have to tell you that. I, I have to imagine, and based on the reporting from our teams, President Biden is probably going to ask Congress to pass more money to help Ukraine fight against Russia. Um, there's also, of course, Israel's fight versus Hamas here. As a Navy veteran, do you believe that your party might be putting allies at risk of losing these conflicts, specifically Ukraine, if the House continues to drag feet on new funding? As a Navy veteran, we cannot leave our allies on the battlefield to bleed out. We also cannot write blank checks and expect the problem to be solved. Americans are mad for a reason. They're mad because they're doing all the things they're supposed to do. They're following the law. They're paying their taxes. They're, they're sending their kids to school. They're doing all the things they're supposed to do. And somehow they are last in this equation. You see the stock market, everything's rising, but somehow they can't afford a home to buy. So they have to live with their parents or they can't sell a home. Something is not right. So this is where Writing a blank check is not going to solve the problem. you got to give our allies exactly what they need in order to win this war. As we know, the Ukraine funding tied to the border as well. And Congressman, I have to ask you, are you disappointed in your own party over what happened with that bill, a bill to try to tackle immigration? You know, one thing is, one, one of the mistakes I believe that the Senate made is they started negotiating with Joe Biden. They should have started negotiating with Donald J. Trump. Joe Biden, is, for all purposes, is a lame duck president. People have given up on him, certainly in his own party, but Republicans no longer respect him at all, zero. So stop negotiating with a lame duck president. 
Donald J. Trump, on the other hand, it's very clear that the party is being led and, and listens to him. So this is, wait, this is where the Senate Congressman, went wrong. I, Congressman, wait, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but you, you're basically saying th that Senate Republicans and House Republicans need to now communicate with former President Trump, even though he holds no office? I think a, a, a former president has more sway than a current president. I'm seeing that right now. I'll give you a, 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 a prime example. Uvalde, you know Uvalde's in my district. I hosted Joe Biden after, after the U Uvalde incident. We spent all day together. I pulled him aside at the very end. I'm not even gonna talk about the border. I asked him for three things. I asked him for money for a mental health clinic. I asked him for money for a new emergency operations center. They were in Uvalde, they're using a war two building. And I asked him money for communications for first for first responders. I got zero response. I had to deliver that on my own through the appropriations bill. We got two million for a mental health clinic. We got two and a half million for an emergency operations center. And we got 4.5 million for new communications. I say that to say, I've given up on the president. I've given up on Joe Biden. A lot of Americans have given up on Joe Biden. And I think Donald J. Trump has more of a chance of getting something over the finish line than, than Joe Biden does. All right. Congressman Tony Gonzalez from Texas. Congressman, thank you very much for making the time for us tonight. I appreciate it. As we take a live look now, you can see that there. It looks as though, I believe, the beast, that's right? the beast. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that zoomed in. I've seen if we could see the president. Can't tell if he got in or not, but we are going to see him any second potentially leaving. And listen, it's a little shaky because this is live listen, TV. Yeah, and they, They're they, out there. Th this wonderful photographer who's out there for the pool for us right now, who's probably shooting this for all the networks, has no idea. His camera's probably hot right now. But <laughs> uh, people are walking by his, his platform probably. It's shaking a little bit, but you can see the Cadillac there, the beast. If you're getting a little nauseous, we get it. We're going to cut away for just one second from this. I want to take you to Julia Ainsley, who is also live for us in Texas. She's watching the border. And Julia, you just heard that conversation Tom and I had with Congressman Gonzalez. You've heard some of the conversations here tonight. Give us a reality check, right? Where do the numbers stand? Where do things stand? Well, the reality is, and funny enough, that the president tonight will make a lot of the same points that Gonzalez just made, that Congressman Gonzalez just made, and that Republicans in Congress are now not willing to negotiate with him on the border because they're now so tied to Trump. But he's going to paint that as a massive problem. In fact, just last week, I was down here at the border, but over in Arizona, where I got to talk to Trump's, I'm mean, sorry, to President Biden's commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, who said because Republicans won't fund that bill, the National security supplemental and other supplemental funding requests, they are going to have to really even get away from even the status quo. They won't be able to continue performing operations. We already know ICE is $500 million in the hole, and they have to start releasing more migrants from detention come May. And this is all as we know that detection equipment for fentanyl, which as we know is so key and on the minds of so many Americans right now, is sitting in a warehouse unused because Republicans haven't been able to give them the funding to put that in the ground. So I think I think this is something the president is going to hit on tonight to say that it's really Republicans who are stymieing his efforts at the border. And that's a big reason why we've seen him wait and not take unilateral action between the failure of that national security supplement on the border component of it and tonight, because he doesn't want to get in the way of this narrative that it's Republicans to blame and that if they don't come to the table and give more funding, it will be their fault if the numbers go up at the border. I will say, as far as the reality check at the border, we're not at record highs. Last mm. year in December, December, we saw record highs of over 12,000 a day. Things are actually a lot quieter now. We see about between five and 7,000 migrants crossing a day. Now, okay. under the Obama administration, they said more than 1,000 a day was too much, but we're not at record highs anymore, Hallie. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much. And if you're wondering why you've been looking at a door, that's the door the President Biden will walk out at the White House, and you can see the balcony there. We expect to see the President, obviously, any minute as he makes that two-mile journey right down Pennsylvania Avenue, literally right behind where we're sitting, to head over to the Capitol. And Tommy. we should let our viewers know that the press is assembled right outside that door you see right there. As soon as the President comes out, we're going to pause for a moment so we can listen to the President take questions. We don't know if he's going to answer them. He obviously has a lot to do tonight, but he may say a few things, so we're going to wait and listen to him. We have several cameras that are live or hot, as we say in this business, all around the White House. You see up here a balcony from the White House as well, I believe. These and then are, also yeah, guests, yeah, looking, guests, guests for the president. We know that the, the first lady has several guests that are going to be sitting with her. And now inside another camera inside the House chambers, as people are entering, I can see Senator Warren and some of the other uh, fine members of our Senate walking Spying through a little far. By the back of the head, yeah, Tom, yeah. Let impressive. me tell you, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can catch him. I can catch him. Um, maybe some more over there. I, I can't tell. It's too far away. Yeah. 
you're looking at Stat Hall, Statuary yeah. Hall, which is where everyone walks through to go take their seats. And just to remind you, there is a lot of pomp and circumstance that, that happens here at the State of the Union. You have lawmakers filing in. And again, one of these rare instances, Tom, where you have both House and Senate members, right, both senators and members of Congress coming in uh, to sit in the same place, to be there, to listen to this speech. And it's a lot of pressure on a president. It's one of the biggest moments of his year as we are taking a look now at all these live cameras that we have up. But I got to be honest with you, Hallie, this one feels a little different, right? Sometimes State of the Unions get a bad rap for being kind of boring. But this one, there is so much pressure on the president. There's also this, you know, these unknowns. Will Republicans fire back at him? Will he be heckled? Will he be heckled by Democrats? Um, who's in the, the the guest of honor, right? Who's not in that guest of honor circle? Um, and then will the president perform? Because the microscope, the spotlight, they're all on him to deliver tonight. Democrats hope he delivers. They have announced the Biden-Harris reelect team that, that the election essentially started this week. You have Super right. Tuesday, and now you have State of the Union. And as we've mentioned, it's going to be the biggest speech because we don't know if there's going to be a debate. It can could we, be the biggest speech until the convention. Well, former President Trump just yeah. said this week he'd debate anytime, anywhere. But can we real talk, Tom? I know Let's you real talk. Real, Let's real talk. talk. Yeah. Like Give me a, a lot vibe of, check. Uh, here's the thing. A lot of people probably don't remember the last few State of the Union speeches or any yeah. state. If you've even watched a State of the Union speech, right? But this year, as you point out, it is right. different. It could be a difference maker as President Biden really fights for his political future here this year in 2024. As we are watching all of this, and again, we are potentially any minute from seeing President Biden walk out that door. And just to remind you, he's going to walk out. You, I can guarantee you, I, I've stood on that uh, that lawn many a time trying to shout some questions at uh, at former presidents. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. He's going to get sometimes in that car. Sometimes they pretend they can't hear you. So, yeah. It's very noisy out there occasionally. They're, he's going to get in the beast. He's going to take the motorcade just down Pennsylvania Avenue. We should have a live shot of every second of it. Two blocks from where we are here in the studio, we'll probably be able to hear the sirens. Our congressional insiders might be able to hear it as well. Molly Ball, senior political correspondent at The Wall Street Journal, and Eugene Scott, political reporter at Axios. Molly, let me start with you with what you're looking for tonight based on the conversations you've heard here, what we've heard from lawmakers, and where this goes. Yeah, I think the number one thing that we're all going to be watching is not so much what the president Allie, says, you know, your but questions uh, wow. to our his uh, demeanor. I, whether he's vigorous, whether he seems to be in command, uh, whether how long he speaks, uh, how smoothly he speaks. Uh, either, you know, the American people have so many questions about whether this president is is up to the job. And uh, and, and so I think that that is the main test he is facing. Uh, beyond that, uh, what, what he talks about is going to be really important. You know, when it comes to immigration, we know that's so important. But does he focus more on blaming Republicans or does he have any actions of his own that he plans to announce tonight? So those are a couple of the things that I'm definitely going to be watching for. Eugene, what, what do you think the American people want to hear from the president? You know, he, he'll have their attention. He'll have their ears tonight. But what does he have to say to connect? As we look at there live pictures is. right now, the yep. vice president walking in uh, to the House chamber right now, followed by uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Of course, Mitch McConnell's last time walking in in this position at the State of the Union. And Vice President Kamala Harris, obviously, walking up. A historic vice president here. And it's interesting, Tom, when we get finally these shots, the cameras go up in the room and we can get a sense of who's in, who's where. And I say, what are they wearing? Not to be, not to be glib about it, but because you can say it, I can't. there are messages that are sent, <laughs> yeah. right? I see a lot of women wearing white here. Uh, I, I believe that is a nod to the suffragist movement there. As you see the vice president shaking hands, she's hugging various folks. Uh, and this is, this is all part of the process here. What's also interesting is when President Biden walks in, he's going to have an opportunity to come down that very same aisle shake some hands, talk to some folks. And you know who likes to shake some hands and talk to some folks? It's President Biden. Right. That walk can be a long walk for him before he begins the speech as we get now our very first look at the chamber on one of, frankly, the biggest and most watched nights in American politics. And we're about to see something we have not seen yet in American history, and that is because this is the first time Speaker Johnson right. will be presiding there in the House, right next to the Vice President, the head of the Senate, we should also point out. and. They'll be behind uh, President Biden, who'll deliver his fourth address to the chambers, but also his, his third State of the Union. And it's interesting, Hallie, because I you have these members. I want to be a fly members. on that wall. Yeah, I want to be a yeah. fly on that chair behind him. I want to know he's what they're small cordial. talking He's about. a gentleman from Louisiana. Like, look how friendly they are. Much different from what we saw last year. I don't know if you remember, but Kevin McCarthy was there, and it wasn't so friendly. And we've seen other times with Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi uh, and Mike Pence. What's interesting, though, and I don't, think, I don't know if people at home know this, but, but the senators and the, and the members of the House that get to shake the hand wait for hours and hours to get that position. Let's listen in to see if, if our... The natural sound from inside the room is picked up by our cameras.
Yeah, they're probably pretty far away to be able to hear any of that audio. As you see, Senator Mitch McConnell there taking it all in. Again, somebody who just this week endorsed former President Trump, despite safe to say, and I think an understatement, bad blood between the two of them ever since January 6th. And been through so much, right? Losing his sister-in-law, making that announcement that he's going to leave that post, um, and also suffering some, some health setbacks last year, you'll remember. Although he will remain, he says, in the Senate. He's going to keep right. his position as a senator, but he will not be the leader. And in that endorsement, listen, Mitch McConnell does not often deliver gushingly exuberant statements about anything, but it was a rather perfunctory endorsement of the former President Trump, noting the requisite support, as you saw Joe Manchin. There's Marjorie Taylor Greene in the red. She might be one to watch here as we talk Someone about we heckling hear Tom. From. We heard from her last last year as well. She, she got up and she right. shouted at the president, heckling him. Uh, she's wearing red tonight, as you mentioned, pointing out what, what some members of Congress are wearing. Uh, we'll be able to spot her, and we see here a delegation from the House all in white. I want to bring in now Maria Teresa Kumar. We mentioned Mark Lauder, Brendan Buck as well. And Brendan, I'll start with you as we see Senator Leahy walk in. You have, you know these rooms. You are somebody who's worked for speakers before. You get what these moments are like. What's going through the mind of the House speakers? You see Mike Johnson now at this moment. It's not his night, no. but he is going to be very visible right yeah. over the president's shoulder for most of the evening. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the, the speakers I worked for tried to make themselves uh, sort of fade into the background. Uh, John Boehner's job, uh, as you would say, was just... Pick a spot on the back of Barack Obama's head and stare at that for, for two hours if you could, not, not to make it. Yeah, but these are, these are big nights. I mean, there are a few nights in the Capitol where there is a palpable energy that you can just tell there is a special moment for democracy taking place, and this is one of those. And even the members who don't necessarily agree with the, the president, they're going to show up because they know this is a big part of our system. It is a big moment for um, the rest of the world to see how we operate. And so... Um, even though there will probably be a little more acrimony in the chamber than there was maybe 15 or 20 years ago when we would do these things, um, it is still a special moment, and, and I expect people will, um, I think, largely rise to the occasion. And Hallie, we, we just saw Representative Cori Bush. I know a lot of eyes are going to be on That's her right. as well to see what she happens in, in reference to the war in Gaza right now, in reference to funding there. Also, in connection to her guests who are going to be in the gallery tonight, because there's also been talk that maybe members who have been invited, uh, people who are sitting up top may also heckle the president. Again, guess, this right. is all things that people are talking about. None of it may happen as we senator, see senators like Senator Rubio enter the chambers right now, but it's stuff we're going to be watching. And let me talk a little bit, too, about some of the optics here as well. You saw those, those uh, members of the Democratic Women's Caucus in white. They are also wearing Fighting for Reproductive Freedom pins. That is going to be another big issue, particularly in light of that controversial Alabama Supreme, uh, Alabama a state court ruling that frozen embryos should be considered children. You can likely expect to hear the president nod to that. On another issue, on the other side of the aisle, Marjorie Taylor Greene wearing a Say Her Name Lakin Riley shirt. Lakin yeah. Riley, of course, the nursing student from the University of Georgia who was killed by, uh, by somebody who had crossed the border who was here. And her, she has become, in many ways, a symbol for Republicans, her death. Her parents had been invited by a Georgia Republican. They chose not to come, but there will be a vacant seat in honor and of And conservatives have, have put a hashtag up, and they put that out on social media as well. Mark Lauders, we look at, at a lot of the Senate Republicans that are entering the chamber right now. We heard something pretty sort of, I, I would say, remarkable from Representative Tony Gonzalez, who essentially said... Donald Trump is the leader of the party. They should negotiate with him, and yet he holds no office right now. Um, is that the status or the state of the Republican Party right now? Can they not sort of govern themselves? They have to sort of check in with the, the former president? No, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, obviously, if we're talking about long-term policy plans, you would check in with the leader of the party. But, you know, the place where I work during the day, the America First Policy Institute, we came out against that bipartisan legislation weeks before the, uh, the former president uh, announced his opposition to it. There was actually bipartisan opposition to it in the Senate. Uh, there was many reasons to oppose that bill. Uh, I know that obviously the president adding his voice to that, I think, put the final nail into it. But uh, a lot, there were a lot of conservatives, especially in the House, that very much opposed that and said, do not bring that over here. Uh, we just saw Representative Hakeem Jeffries, as we should point out. Do you yeah. know who we haven't seen who's here, apparently? Are you ready for, your, are you ready for a real... George yeah. Santos. 
He is no where? longer in Congress. We haven't seen him yet, but he is apparently in the building. What? He was expected Who to come. Him? He has, uh, I'm going to turn to, if we have Ryan Nobles getting yeah. ready. I know Ryan was moving to a place where he had a headset. He's going to be able to watch all this and be able to speak with us in a couple of minutes here. He apparently has floor privileges. As a former member, Brendan, as, a, as you know, he can return. Any former member who's, I think, not been expelled, and he was not, does have floor privileges for the rest of their lives unless they are a lobbyist. All he right, also showed up, was it in Iowa or New Hampshire? He showed up to the Trump victory party in Iowa or New Hampshire. Um, I guess he's going to be sort of a, a conservative Republican pseudo-celebrity uh, either invited or not invited, but we'll, we'll definitely look out for him. We've seen a lot of uh, both Republican and Democratic senators as they enter the chambers here. Um, Senator Ted Cruz. Senator there, Ted Cruz. Well. Yeah, of course, from the border state of Texas, handily winning his primary just a couple of nights ago. Yeah, he's got another Senate race coming up. Maria Teresa Kumar, talk to us about about the issue of abortion and and how much you hope the president focuses his speech on this topic. Well, I think if you see who are the guests of different members of Congress and the First yeah. Lady, they are from, Hello. they are uh, Katie Cox from Texas who had to leave Texas in order to get an abortion. There is the woman from Alabama talking about IVF. And so this is front and center. One of the things that we learned during the red wave that did not happen during the midterm elections was that there were plenty of independent and moderate Republican dads who said abortion is going just a, time to, a bit too far. And so that red wave that we expected did not happen because of Abortion is absolutely one of the things that every single American recognizes, that we want freedom. What we're going to hear from the president is not just framing freedom as a woman's agency, but it's going to be about general freedoms. If the government is all of a sudden deciding who can or cannot be part of your family planning, then all of a sudden it should ricochet on what other freedoms are they going to take away from you. And I do think that there was such a misstep on this IVF on the Republican side from Alabama, yeah. because all of a sudden energized women that may have not been in the game prior, because IVF usually means that I cannot leave the state. My mm -hmm. family planning now happens at home, and it becomes very personal. And this idea that someone is now interjecting yes. in that message I want to go to Ryan. I'll take really Ryan. Really All right, we're going to check in with some of our reporters. I do want to circle back to the topic of IVF in Alabama, because we know the person who's going to give the rebuttal tonight, Senator Katie Britt, mm -hmm. has her own story from the state of Alabama. I'm going to check in first with Ryan Nobles. Ryan, so we were getting some early indications that, that you know, obviously a lot of the faces we, we've, known with, we've known about but then also some surprise guests as we're looking at Senator Bernie Sanders. Um, and also, Ryan, just so you know, I may have to interrupt you because we're starting to see some action at the White House as well. If we can put those live picks for our viewers right now. So, Ryan, tell us what, what, what new report you have about who's in the gallery. Yeah, well, um, I, the first thing I just have to say, Tom, uh, that stands out as you're sitting in this room right now is the sea of uh, Democratic women members of Congress who have uh, worked it out together to dress in all white uh, as part of a message that they're sending related to women's rights and reproductive rights. Uh, and not only did they all dress uh, in the same color, but they've all uh, decided to kind of bunch themselves together and sit in, a, in, the, in the same area. Uh, and so when you walk into the room, your eyes are immediately drawn to that area. Uh, and part of what we see a lot of these members do uh, is try and send a message, even though they aren't going to be the ones speaking tonight. And there's no doubt that they are sending that message uh, through just the way that they're dressed and that the color that they chose to wear. Uh, that they're not the only ones that are doing this. Uh, you know, there are Republican members, and we can see them from our perch up in the gallery, who are wearing uh, white ribbons and also uh, buttons uh, that say the name Lincoln, uh, uh, that say uh, a name of the of the. Uh, young woman who was killed by a migrant lake in Riley. Listen the young in, woman. everybody. We're going to listen in to see if the president says anything. brief comment to the folks up on the balcony joking don't jump I need you to his supporters who have gathered there up over at the White House as he gets into his vehicle affectionately nicknamed the beast and gets ready for that quick drive down Pennsylvania Avenue quicker than Tom you or I could do it since you won't have any traffic lights to contend with that's one of the perks of course of being president a significant moment for him as you saw the first lady walk out just ahead of him obviously the guests that she and he will have as their people here at the State of the Union, significant and meant to send a message to see the president saying a few words there, talking probably to his wife inside the vehicle, pointing to the cameras who are out there as well. Peter Alexander is live for us on the other side of the White House, on the North Lawn. Peter, talk us through some of these moments here.
Yeah, Hallie, just a moment ago, as the president walked out there on the south portico of the White House before entering the beast, we heard him, reporters yelling questions to him, among others, asking him how he's feeling right now. He said good before looking at other staff members, telling them not to jump, as you joke. He said uh, he's going to need them. There he is alongside the first lady, though, as they uh, wave. This is the president's third State of the Union, but obviously the stakes in this one, as we've noted, are so much more critical than they have been in any speech she has delivered before the American people to this point. And as I speak to White House advisors, they acknowledge that there's going to be a lot of focus tonight on the president's delivery, but really what they think the focus should be on tonight is on what the president has delivered. And they recognize the urgency of this moment to best communicate to the American people, Americans who don't pay attention to the news headlines every day, for whom this is a unique opportunity to hear from him in this venue, speaking for more than an hour, as expected tonight. White House aides have insisted. and. And frankly, polling shows that they're right on a lot of these issues, that many of the president's policy positions and his accomplishments are viewed as popular, but that a lot of Americans don't know that he is responsible for some of those accomplishments. The president, as you've been reporting, expected to frame this as a comeback story of sorts, reminding people how we got here. January 2021, you'll remember, more than 100,000 Americans died. That was the deadliest month of the pandemic for the United States and the difference this president will insist that he has made in helping the country rebound in the course of that time, in spite of a lot of work that still needs to be done. You've hit these highlights, but I'm told by a senior advisor as I walk out here, the president right out of the gates is going to focus heavily on the topic of democracy, not just around the world, Ukraine certainly on that front, but here at home with the threat posed by the former president, Donald Trump. Hallie and Tom. with former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi right there. We also want to point out that caravan that was behind the beast is all part of sort of the formation that goes from the White House to Capitol Hill as the president makes his way there. We expect them there, Hallie, in just a few minutes. The drive is, is pretty fast. The question I, I still wonder about is that protest, and if, it, if at all it, the president can hear it, if it makes it to his radar, there's people who have even told him that there's a pro-Palestinian protest happening just outside uh, Capitol Hill and just outside of where his speech is going to take place. Uh, seeing a sea of white right now That's inside right. the House chamber. A lot of women, obviously female uh, Democrats, uh, representatives, who wanted it to send a big message tonight. Yeah, and listen, there is a, a part of this that is about the optics, right? It's about how things look. It's about who you're texting. And what Thomas is, that, Massey, device? What is that device there? I don't, I don't know if I know what that device uh, is. I believe that looks like a countdown <laughs> clock on the debt. national debt. Right, no, national debt clock. Debt right. clock. That's Molly a, Ball, thank you for a pointing common that out thing that uh, some, some of these Republicans will wear at, uh, at times. I want to bring in Ryan Noble, who I believe we have, who has probably one of the best seats in the House for somebody who is not a member of Congress or an invited guest. And Ryan, you are up there. Uh, we don't have Ryan just yet. We have David Pluff, in fact, Democratic strategist, somebody who knows what it is like to have a high stakes moment like this. And I was talking to David earlier in the night. And David, talk talk to our viewers about if you had the chance to speak to President Biden. I, you, I know you've been in this position before, as we see a live pictures here of Senator Romney in the chamber. But if, if you had a chance to speak to President Biden right before he departed for Capitol Hill, what's the one piece of advice you'd give him tonight? Well, try and keep it limited because you don't want to put too much in their head. I'd probably say have fun. You know, you've prepped, the speech is ready, mm. you've practiced performance. Go out there and let it rip and the be loose. Session will come to order. We're going to pause for a moment and listen to Speaker members Johnson. Members of the committee on the part of the House to escort the President of the United States into the chamber. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Stefanik. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Mrs. McLean. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. The gentlewoman or gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar. The gentleman from California, Mr. Liu. The gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Del Bene. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagus. The gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Underwood. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Escobar. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Trahan. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. Speaker Johnson there. 
acknowledging all the leadership in, in the House. The and we'll listen to the Vice President. president yeah. of, the pres of the Senate to escort the President of the United States into the House chamber. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer. The Senator from Illinois, Mr. Durbin. The Senator from Washington, Mrs. Murray. The Senator from Michigan, Ms. Stabenow. The Senator from Minnesota, Ms. Klobuchar. The Senator from Virginia, Mr. Warner. The Senator from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. The Senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell. The Senator from South Dakota, Mr. Thune. The Senator from Wyoming, Mr. Barrasso. The Senator from West Virginia, Mrs. Capito. And the Senator from Iowa, Ms. Ernst. The members of the escort committee will exit the chamber through the lobby doors. The escort committee appointed by the speaker and by the vice president as we are just minutes away now from President Biden walking in for his State of the Union address. Potentially, depending on how things go in November, his final or perhaps not. And maybe his most important, right? And I think I think everyone will agree to that. You were mentioning the pomp and circumstance yeah. of this moment as we look at Representative Matt Gates from Florida, someone else who possibly could possibly heckle uh, the former president. And uh, we're looking here as, as other senators gather um, to talk about likely the importance of this speech and what happens next, right? And, and what to expect from President Biden. Eugene Scott, who joins us now, um, Eugene, what are you looking out for in the, in the president's speech? Well, I'm looking forward to him addressing many of the issues that we know voters have said are concern him uh, in surveys and polls, and one of them, quite frankly, is his age. He's going to have to look energetic. Uh, there needs to be vigor. He needs to be sharp. And let these individuals know that he has what it takes to stay in leadership. Molly, as, as you watch what happens here, how, how much of a fight is going to happen tonight? How much of the heckling to back and forth? Well, Republicans seem to have concluded that the back and forth last year did them no favors. I think we've heard a lot of them say they, they expect more decorum tonight, in part because they don't want to give Joe Biden that political gift. Last year, when he was able to sort of clap back at them, that was a moment that the White House really relished, and I don't think Republicans enjoyed it very much. So we'll see. It may be too big a temptation for, for some of the, his opponents to, to want to, to, to yell at him, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they sit on their hands a little bit. As, as we wait for others to enter the chambers right now and of course just behind them the president how much politically do you think it's going to matter for him if if he hits it out of the park or if he has stumbles Historically, we have not seen presidents get much of a bump out of these State of the Union addresses. It's sort of an inside Washington phenomenon. But as many people have said tonight, this is so high stakes for this president. I think in the, weight of, in the wake of last month's special counsel report, that really amplified so many concerns among voters across the board, among Democrats specifically, about the president's age, about his ability to perform. So if he's able to, as you said, hit it out of the park, perhaps that does make a difference. Perhaps that does reset the narrative for him. And of course, if he does stumble in some way, I think that could be absolutely disastrous. As we just saw Marjorie Taylor Greene as well. Um, Eugene Scott, you know, th this is going to be a close election. Every poll shows that. Uh, the president having some issues with minority groups across the country, including Arab Americans, black Americans, Hispanics. Do, do you think he, he addresses any of those groups tonight? Uh, I think that's very possible. I mean, we know that he's going to talk about the conflict in Gaza, and this is something that many voters want to hear about, including young voters, a demographic that he needs to be victorious in many of those states that will determine who will win in November. Uh, we were just listening as they were announcing the Supreme Court is now entering, led by Chief Justice John Roberts, who will uh, appear. There he is. Sonia Sotomayor, I believe, just behind him. Justice Korshik, Korshik, Elena Kagan, Justice Kavanaugh as well. And I think we, we also have our first pictures of the beast that is carrying the president right now as it enters Capitol Hill and makes that left turn into a secure location where the president will be able to depart and enter the chambers along with his wife, the first lady. They will split up for a short time so she can go up to the gallery and watch the speech with her uh, invited guests. And Molly, something that I found interesting was that th there will be a lot of important people that will be um, sort of uh, acknowledged. Um, th there will be nobody from, from Israel, uh, no, no Palestinian, nobody from Gaza. It, it seems they sort of avoided that when it came to guests. 
You know, I, it, this is a little bit of a, a different topic, but on the subject of the court, one thing we do yeah. know is that the president plans to call out the Supreme Court yep. and talk about Roe v. Wade, talk specifically. Those were one quote, of the excerpts released, uh, right? The, the decision that, that was made by the court and, and say, you know, the court said that women have political power and they've shown that uh, in his in talking about his desire to see Roe reinstated. So, I mean, I think on, on Gaza, it'll be very interesting. Does he does the president want to speak to that left wing of the party that has been protesting, that we see protesting outside tonight? Or is he going to speak to the broad middle of the American electorate that is more favorable to Israel? I'll be very interested to As we see uh, Justice Kentanji Brown Jackson in the Supreme Court will have such a significant role in this election as well. They already have weighing on some of the court cases that involve former President Trump. Uh, right now, all smiles. Sometimes we, we've had the justices uh, not smiling during States of the Union, but uh, we'll see what happens tonight. We are moments away from the president about to enter the chamber. Uh, we want to thank all of our guests tonight on this portion of our broadcast. But now we want to go to an NBC News special report. Tonight, President Biden on the state of our union. The president sent to address a bitterly divided Congress, outlining the challenges facing Americans at home and abroad. The war in Ukraine now at a critical crossroads, while fears remain of a wider war spreading in the Middle East. Here at home, despite an improving economy, Americans under pressure with the cost of living still stubbornly high. Plus, growing tensions over some key issues, including immigration and abortion rights. With eight months until the general election and his approval rating underwater, can the president make the case that the State of the Union is strong? From NBC News, President Biden's State of the Union, live from Washington, here are Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie. Good evening and welcome everyone to our NBC News coverage of President Biden's State of the Union address. Tonight is a pivotal night for the president as he prepares to deliver what could be the most important speech of his presidency. We are still eight months out from the general election, but with that rematch now sent between him and former President Trump, tonight might be the president's best chance to get his message out there. Members of Congress already assembled on the House floor. The message expected to address the most critical issue the country is facing, including immigration, the economy, and of course, two wars raging overseas. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles is inside the chamber. Ryan, what are you seeing there as uh, folks continue to file their way in? Well, Lester, we're already seeing members of Congress displaying messages that they want the world to see. Even though they're not going to have a voice in this room here tonight, they want to make sure the policy issues that they care about are front and center. Among them, you see a sea of white, and this is the women from the Democratic caucus. They decided to band together to wear white in representation of women's rights and in particular reproductive rights. Something else to look for tonight is that some members purposely wearing yellow and blue to show their ongoing support of Ukraine and, of course, the push for that supplemental aid package to pass at some point. We're also noticing Republicans in the crowd today, many of them wearing white ribbons. Uh, this is their way of demonstrating their concerns about the ongoing border crisis and the violence that they believe is associated with it. Some also displaying pins with the name of Lake and Riley, who, of course, was that young woman who was allegedly murdered by an undocumented immigrant. You know, Lester and Savannah, it's important to point out that tonight the president is entering what is really one of the most partisan House chambers in a generation. There's, of course, only just a few votes separating Republicans and Democrats. Those slim margins make it really difficult for Congress to get anything of substance accomplished. And because that partisanship is at an all-time high, there is, of course, the possibility of the president being heckled by members of his opposing party. And although the new speaker, Mike Johnson, who it's important to point out, he'll be sitting behind the president for the first time. He's only been in the job for a couple of months. He has instructed his members to abide by the House rules, and he's told them to display what he calls decorum. The other thing we'll be looking for tonight, Lester and Savannah, is that there's going to be several guests in the gallery who represent various causes. They have been invited by members of Congress or the White House, among them the families of the American hostages that are still being captive in, held captive in Gaza and, of course, caught up in that conflict between Hamas and Israel. And, of course, we do expect the conflict in the Middle East to be a key focus tonight. We do know that the president will address the situation 
But as we talk about protesters, there's also that possibility that an individual member, maybe of the president's own party, or perhaps one of their guests, attempts to stage some sort of a protest to put pressure on President Biden to work to bring an end to the war and, of course, the humanitarian crisis uh, that is playing out there in the Middle East. And then we should also not forget that all of this comes against the backdrop of the ongoing impeachment inquiry that was launched by House Republicans. They've been, of course, investigating the president's family. Uh, this has uh, been an investigation that's been going on for months. The president's son recently testifying in front of the impeachment inquiry committees. Now, the White House has dismissed this all as a sham. Even some House Republicans have, of course, said that this has failed to deliver the evidence necessary. But it's something to keep in the back of your mind as the president addresses this group here tonight, that there are many of these members who believe that he should be impeached, even though at this point they've yet to demonstrate the evidence that would rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. So we do expect the president in this chamber uh, very shortly. At this point, members are just milling about. Uh, having conversations with each other, uh, catching up as they prepare for this moment. It's interesting, uh, Lester and Savannah, we were in the chamber very early this afternoon, around 3 o'clock, and there were already members lining up to get those key coveted seats along the aisle where the president will walk in so that they can get that moment, shake the president's hand, and be seen on national television and seen by millions of Americans. It's, of course, one of the most coveted seats in politics, and we're going to see that on full display here when the president enters this room in just a couple of minutes. Yeah, Savannah, Savannah noting quite a contrast in the number of people and the people we're seeing in there, including George Santos. An expelled member of Congress who's still, as a former member of Congress not convicted of a crime, has a right to be there on the House floor and has decided to come tonight. No invitation necessary. So he's there. Just one of the many storylines that we see developing on the floor tonight. And, and the timing of all this coming two days after Super Tuesday, a prime moment uh, the, the, the president has to really get his message out there to respond to the darker view of America that Republicans have been offering. We want to bring in our chief White House correspondent, uh, Peter Alexander. Uh, Peter, what can we expect from the president? Lesser, in effect, this is the starting gun on the 2024 campaign, as a senior aide to the president described to me. I think there's a couple things to keep an eye on. This is a night that's filled with both challenges and opportunities. The challenge here, of course, the president facing low approval ratings. Many Americans uh, have questions, real concerns about his age, his physical and mental health right now. But it's an opportunity because the president has accomplished in the eyes of the White House a lot since coming to office. And that's why they're going to try to frame this as a comeback story of sorts. You'll remember January 2021, more Americans died due to COVID that month when the president came to office than any other month during the course of the pandemic. More than 105,000 Americans. And yet the economy has been growing in the time since. The president will tout the strong job growth. They'll tout the fact that inflation, though still high, is now two thirds of what it was at its peak. And while a lot of the focus for many Americans, given concerns about the president's age, will be on his delivery, the White House's primary focus tonight is on what the president has delivered for the American people. I'm told by a senior aide as I walked out to the North Lawn to speak with you this evening that the president right out of the gates is going to focus specifically on the topic of democracy, not just around the world, including in places like Ukraine, but here at home with the threat that's posed by the potential for another Trump presidency. The topic of reproductive rights, as Ryan noted a moment ago, is going to be key with um, a, a key individual in the first lady's box this evening being someone whose family benefited from IVF. Another one, an individual there who is someone who sued the state of Texas for its um, near total abortion ban. And finally, of course, is the issue of the economy as well. The president will sharply contrast his vision, his time in office to that of his predecessor, though he may not refer to him as name. And on that topic, the president's going to say, my lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, to give hate no safe harbor. Now some other people my age see a different story, an American story of resentment, revenge and retribution. That is not me. Just one example of the contrast the president is expected to make tonight uh, from excerpts we received only a short time ago, Lester and Savannah.
All right, Peter, thank you. And to set the scene, there we see former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, members of Congress mixing and mingling with members of the cabinet, Supreme Court justices that have assembled there. We see the second gentleman entering right now. We await the State of the Union, one of the storied traditions of our democracy. The president addressing the nation in just a few moments. He's left the White House, and we expect him to enter that chamber at any moment. By tradition, he will be announced, and then he'll enter. We'll have applause. We'll have a moment to keep chatting. And for that, we turn for the moment to our moderator of Meet the Press, Kristen Welker. Uh, second gentleman giving a shout out there to <laughs> Vice President Harris, his wife. So when you talk about a State of the Union, it's so often in past years about policy. It certainly will be tonight. President Biden needs to lay out what he would do with a second term. But it is also about performance tonight. There are persistent questions about his age. It shows up in poll after poll. It is no secret how he performs tonight is as key as anything that he says from that podium. Savannah, you've hit the nail on the head. This is an extraordinary moment for that very reason, because yes, we're going to be paying attention to all of his policy proposals, but everyone is going to be focused on his performance. Think about last year. He was widely seen as giving a very strong, robust speech in part because when Republicans jeered at him, when they heckled him, he flipped it around. He turned it on their head. Can he show the same type of fight? Here comes the First Lady entering the chamber. If we want to pause for a moment. And Savannah, I think that that is what people will be looking for tonight. Does he show the same fight? And does it feel authentic? We know that the White House has been preparing for some jeering from Republicans, even though the House Speaker has encouraged his conference not to do that. But undoubtedly, that is something we might see. All right, we'll pause for a moment as the president is about to be introduced. Mr. Speaker, the president's cabinet. And Hallie, as we can continue our discussion as we wait for the president, there's also the question, will the president go on the defense about some of the issues, immigration, the economy, or take a, the alternative view and a, and a positive, affirmative case for his policies? Well, I think you'll see both, but on the issue of immigration, I can tell you based on conversations that I've had with sources close to the Biden campaign, he will look to flip the script on immigration. He is going to look to do what he's been trying to do with a smaller audience. Obviously, he's got tens of millions of eyeballs on him tonight to try to point out, hey, wait a second, you could have passed a comprehensive bipartisan border security bill and Congress did not. I would not be surprised to hear the president talk about that tonight in a full-throated way. I also spoke with a member of Republican leadership who's in the room tonight who suggested that that may not be the most effective line of attack for the president. Republicans have been going after him on the humanitarian crisis at the border for months now. This is one of the central arguments against him as we've seen something really interesting happen. For the last however many years we, we sit here we talk about how the economy, people's money is what drives them to get out and vote come November. Remember, this year now, for one of the first times, we are seeing in some polls immigration overtake that as the number one issue that affects people. I will tell you, I was texting with a Democratic member of Congress who's now in the room. I asked how this person was feeling. They said, I'm excited, but honestly, a little bit anxious because there is a lot riding on the president's performance tonight, Savannah, as you point out, not what he says, but how he says it. Yeah, and Kristen, he's been rehearsing this speech. He was at Camp David this, this weekend. We've been told that he's been going over it with a fine tooth comb really looking at every single word. He knows how important this is. He knows the stakes of this moment. He has been making the case against Donald Trump in recent weeks. Tonight is his night to make the case for Joe Biden, to counter the critics who say that he doesn't have it in him to serve another four years. I also think that there is a political challenge here. He's got to energize the base tonight. He's got to do that. But he also has to reach across the aisle to those Nikki Haley independent voters, moderates. Those are the types of voters who could make a big difference in some of these. Well, he came, right, he came right out when, when uh, Donald Trump appeared to reject those voters and said, I'll take them. They're, they're welcome in my campaign. That's right. And remember what Donald Trump has said. He's basically said, I don't need those voters. So those voters are for the taking. Although on Tuesday night in a statement, he did say, if you want to join yes. my movement, you yes. may. But he was not yes. moving in their direction. He said, feel free to move in my direction. But it raises the political question you raise is really interesting. Because, Hallie, do you perceive this election about 
turning out your base. Mm -hmm. And is, is the enthusiasm on the left against Trump more than it's for Biden? And does that create an opportunity for Biden then to move to the center if he wants to, tr to try to capture those independents, the suburban so, moms, the, you know, the, the tried and true swing voters who decide so many elections? To make the bet uh, that the progressives to his left are not going to find Donald Trump more palatable than Joe Biden, however concerned they are about some of the, right. the issues that they have, like his handling of the Israel-Hamas war, absolutely. Because listen, this is going to have to be both, right? Is the, if the answer is both. It's a turnout election. You've got to turn out your base. But the margins are so close here that but you also have to appeal to those suburban moms in those swing swing battleground states. And that's going to be critical for either President Biden or for former President Donald Trump to do, who, by the way, he's watching. I mean, now that we are hitting the general election full swing this week, 240 days to go now until November, he is going to be, he says, you know, quote unquote, fact checking or at least responding to some of the things that the president's saying. But Kristen, we just said this on Tuesday night. I'm going to say it again, say it again. Hallie. It, it's a rematch of 2020. Now we know it's not a replay. Things are different four years later. Things are very different. First of all, former President Trump is facing four different indictments. His first criminal trial gets underway later this month. So that is a massive difference. In the primary, it has emboldened him. It's energized him. It's allowed him to galvanize Republican voters around him. How will it play in the general election? Here's why it's also different. During the last election cycle, Candidate Biden was never trailing former President Trump. Very different situation this time around. Polls show he's trailing him in general election polls, as well as in key battleground state polls. And that's what, based on my conversations with the president's allies, really has them concerned. It gets back to the idea of, of, of losing the narrative. And in this, in this case, President Biden, a lot of the supporters think that he's been slow to respond to some of these things. That's right. They say that he hasn't shown enough urgency. And in fact, I was speaking to some of his closest allies today who said, tonight's when you are going to see that urgency. Everything starts tonight. And they say this is when people really start paying attention. We'll have to see if that's the case. Well, and voters want to see that he has a pep in his step. Let's turn to Christine Roman. She's our senior business correspondent. And Hallie does mention now that immigration is right up yeah. there. It's been the it's the economy stupid right. has been the political cliche since the, the 90s. Well, now it's the economy and it's immigration. But the economy is such an interesting picture because, as you well know, and I know you have these numbers memorized, so many of the metrics show an improving economy, and yet people don't say they feel it. And it comes down to inflation, and specifically the grocery store. Absolutely. The state of the American economy is strong. This should be a big advantage in a State of the Union address, but the state of the American psyche is skeptical or exhausted, depending on who you talk to, and exhausted by, you know, the, the, the three years of higher inflation. Inflation is moderating. You'll hear the president say that today. He won't say it's mission accomplished, but prices are higher than they were three years ago. Here comes the president. Mr. Speaker, the president of the United States.
president who spent a lot of time in these chambers still has a, a lot of friends and acquaintances and he will take his time as he has in previous years making his way through this crowd and greeting virtually anyone who can stand along the sidelines. I'm so struck by it because I mean more than anywhere in Washington the halls of Congress are where Joe Biden feels at home having spent literally decades in Congress and also having run for president three times you can imagine a young Joe Biden imagined himself in this role That's and it right. seems he's relishing every single minute <laughs> and this is the Joe Biden that so many people are, are familiar with the glad handing the chit chatting He's going to stretch out this moment. Who knows how long we'll be talking here until the president goes to deliver his speech. And what's so interesting, right, we talk about both sides of the aisle. You've got the president in the aisle talking with Republicans. He spent some time there. Those are some of the Republican members he was greeting. Obviously, that's Democrat, Democratic Majority Leader Chuck Schumer behind him. But this is a place where... He does have a level of comfort where he does know folks. It's also interesting as we've been looking at these cameras in the room, looking at these live feeds as it's happening, the way that you saw his cabinet members come in. As we know that uh, Secretary Miguel Cardona is the designated survivor. That, of course, is always something we look for at a State of the Union address. But did you see Secretary Mayorkas getting greeted frequently by Democratic members as he now is facing so much heat, so much fire, this impeachment push from House Republicans? There's a lot of drama in this room. There's some tension. You don't see it on the president's face, at least at the moment, but look at this shot. Marjorie Taylor Greene right behind him, and I, I believe that's a hat that says Make America Ma Great Again. A MAGA hat, and then there are buttons uh, that we understand that some Republicans will be wearing, uh, you know, talking about the, the border, the Biden border well, crisis. Listen. She said, say her name, Lakin Riley. Lakin Riley is that nursing student who was killed at the campus of the University of Georgia not long ago. Uh, and it has become a flashpoint for many Republicans with the suspect in that case, a migrant who crossed into this country. Uh, and Republicans have gone so far, some of them, as to suggest that President Biden has blood on his hands and her death. Her parents were invited, chose not to come. Well, a lot of the members of Congress, the Republican members of Congress, are wearing either pins or ribbons or, in some cases, a picture of that young woman who was tragically killed. And we just saw Marjorie Taylor Greene. I'm glad, Holly, that your lip reading or your is, is, skills are in mm -hmm. fine form or you have better hearing than I did because I couldn't make that out myself. But so we see the president enter. I mean, talk about relishing the moment. You know, the exit last year was 20 minutes long, <laughs> which in past years, it's five, six, seven minutes. But this is somebody who wants to greet every person, who wants to do retail politicking with these members of Congress. And in some cases, Kristen, these members Members of Congress will come in the afternoon. Unless you're a member of leadership, there's no designated seating, so you've got to save your seat. Absolutely. And members of Congress will do it to snap a selfie, or in the case perhaps of Marjorie Taylor Greene, to have that moment. Here's have Joe Manchin. One one. Here's Joe Manchin, who's of course announced he's not running for re-election. Uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Democrats very concerned, uh, bracing for the very strong likelihood that they will lose that seat. But look, I, I go back to what we were saying that Joe Biden has spent a lot of time in these chambers. One of his closest aides was asked, is he nervous for a moment this big? Mm. The answers from this aide was no, he doesn't get nervous. This is where he is most comfortable. Um, in terms of the top officials we've seen within his administration, I was struck by Secretary Antony Blinken, who has spent weeks, months overseas trying secure, to secure a deal to get the hostages released in the Middle East uh, in, in Israel's war against Hamas. They have not been able to reach that deal. That looms large over this There evening. may be some policy announcements, announcements this very night on that, on that issue because this is obviously a huge international issue. It's a political issue for President Biden as well as many young voters, many voters on the progressive left are dismayed at the president's wholehearted support for Israel. We heard the Vice President Kamala Harris with very strong words asking for a ceasefire. It'd be interesting to day. see if he matches those words or goes farther. Uh, that's right. I mean, this is one of the most complicated policy issues that this administration and this president faces. We anticipate that he's going to announce a new ramped up military effort to get aid into Gaza. And so that is going to be significant. But this has divided the Democratic Party with young voters uh, signaling that they disapprove. We hear a chant. I want to go to Ryan Nobles, who's in the chamber. Uh, Ryan, are you hearing four more years? I, how, how are your powers yeah. of hearing and lip reading? <laughs> Hopefully I can hear a little bit better uh, in the actual room, Savannah. But yes, it did appear 
as the president made his way down past uh, the actual seating of the members. He's now, of course, making his way uh, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, just greeted members of the Supreme Court. But just as he got down to kind of the final stage before he heads up to the lectern, uh, the Democratic members were chanting four more years and clapping loudly for the president. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it's, it, it's really uh, kind of stark to see him in a room like this uh, where he is so great one-on-one. -on -one. That is what President Biden is known for. Uh, where perhaps sometimes in a big speech he's known for verbal gaps or other issues. When he's having a conversation with someone, he often makes that person feel like they're the most important person in the room. And even in a venue like this, where he has cameras staring at him, millions of people watching all over the world, uh, he takes a moment with each and every person uh, that he sees as he makes his way down the aisle uh, and has that moment with them. Uh, in some cases, it's like he's seeing a friend he hasn't seen in a long time with a big hug and it looks as though he's sharing some sort of moment with him. And just to get back to that moment with Marjorie Taylor Greene coming down the aisle, you know, we could see her don her hat, uh, clearly looking to have a viral moment. She also had uh, her camera, uh, her camera phone pointed at the president the entire time. So I'm sure that's something that she's gonna attempt to make a big deal of on conservative media. It didn't seem to bother the president at all. Uh, it, it couldn't tell from our vantage point whether or not he engaged with her or just kind of uh, walked by as she was uh, trying to get her message to him. So. This is, I would imagine, somewhat of a frustration for the planners of this event here tonight. Uh, I don't know if they back-timed enough or worked up uh, enough time <laughs> for Joe Biden to, to, to greet all these folks. I, you know, I think there's a level of frustration for him as president that he doesn't have the opportunity to have these conversations as frequently as he did when he was a member of the Senate. Well, he is taking the podium now, and we'll be hearing from the president in a moment. And Krista, very quickly, as we, we watched him a moment ago pass by members of the Supreme Court, and it made it made me wonder at least how many times will this court potentially touch issues related to this race? Absolutely, we await their decision on whether former President Trump deserves immunity in the January 6th trial, Esther. Cody. If I were smart, I'd go home now. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons 
That means the defendant, so. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined and their minister is here tonight. Can they stand up? Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrection stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. As I've done ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you, without regard to party, to join together and defend democracy. Remember your oath of office, foreign and domestic. Respect.
respect free and fair elections, restore trust in our institutions, and make clear political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest history is watching or watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Joining us the light is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. 14 months ago, 14 months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. But the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. Guarantee the right to ADF. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos. That has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about that. about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear, record losses. Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate, raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones, millions left behind. A mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, 
fail the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a th news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <clears throat> so let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. Investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot, and we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. I inherited economy is on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years. A record. A record. <laughs> Unemployment at 50 year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up. Inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. Right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my pre predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. <laughs> Creating good paying American jobs. And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, instead of we, private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. <clears throat> In fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion in private sector investment in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. <clears throat> and, thanks, and thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted against it or they're cheering on that money coming in. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. 
And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. <laughs> Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. <clears throat> Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities because of my investment in family farms. Because I invested in family farms led by my sector of agriculture who knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave, leave home to make a living. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois, home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, auto factories reopening, a new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same The folks of Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs of the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Here tonight, is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And, and Dawn... And Dawn Sims, a third-generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line, and today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Tonight, I want to talk about the future of possibilities that we can build together. A future where the days of trickle-down economics are over and the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up in a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. When they do well, the poor of a way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it.
was a law that I proposed and signed. Not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it. We finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make, they only get paid 35 a month now and still make healthy profit. And I want to... But what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for every American in Egypt. Everyone. For years, people have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, just like the VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors' money. It's saving taxpayers' money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. Will not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. <laughs> Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year. Even for expensive cancer drugs, it costs ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. I want to cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get in Air Force One, we're going to fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow. I mean, excuse me. And it, well, even Moscow, probably. And bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40% the cost you're paying now. Same company, same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's, it's still a very big deal. million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. Well, my predecessor and many in this chamber want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The, we, the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. <laughs> to state the obvious, women are more than half our population. But research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. So, pa so pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. <clears throat> I know the cost of housing is so important to you. If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well. And the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. Yeah. 
And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of renters, we're cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. Now pass. Now pass and build and renovate two million affordable homes and bring those rents down. <laughs> to remain the strongest economy in the world, we need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know, I think I pointed out last year, I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing, having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50% more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two and four year degree, no matter what their background is. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the business roundtable. They were mad that I, they were angry. I said, well, they were discussing <laughs> why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them as vice president, I met with over eight, I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides of the aisle. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them and I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world? And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands on experience and a path to good paying job, whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable. Let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle class families and increase record investments in HBCU and minority serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. And I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans. I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly four million Americans, including nurses, firefighters, and others in public service. Like Keenan Jones, a public educator from Minnesota, who's here with us tonight. Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college. Now he's able to help, after debt forgiveness, get his own daughter to college. And folks, look. Such relief is good for the economy because folks are now able to buy a home, start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want the public school teachers a raise.
And by the way, the first couple of years, we cut the deficit. Now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. I signed the bipartisan deal to cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. It's my goal to cut the federal deficit another three trillion by making big corporations very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look, I'm a capitalist. If you want to make or can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay your fair share in taxes. A fair tax code is how we invest things to make this country great. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top in 1%, the very wealthy and the biggest corporation, and exploded the federal deficit. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? No. Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No. I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax code fair is to make big corporations and the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15%. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise corporate minimum tax to at least 21%. So every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million, a million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay them 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2%. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. I propose minimum tax for billionaires at 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. And imagine what that could do for America. Imagine a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave, because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine, imagine the future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. The working people, 
The working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will. That's the proposal. Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share. Look. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations engaged in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby Casey's bill and stop this. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. You get, you get charged the same amount, and you got about, I don't know, 10% fewer Snickers in it. <laughs> Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees. Those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, re, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. <laughs> Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front so there are no surprises. It matters. It matters. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges to help tackle the backload of 2 million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. What are you against? One hundred more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is a, yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know. I know you know how to read. I believe that given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. 
I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels a political win. He viewed it as a, be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner, not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the $8,000. But, but, if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and gum all that way, knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. <laughs> Folks, I would respectfully say, to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together, but that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will not separate families. <laughs> <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it, as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And so much more. But unlike my predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. And we're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some to flee persecution. To chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere. But we're all Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers for justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten, they were bloody, and left for dead. Our late friend and former colleague, John Lewis, was on that march. We miss him. Joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers. She sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed and was signed into law. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, there are forces taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of march with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Right Act. And stop, stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise the federal minimum wage, because every worker has a right to a decent living more than a seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. Conserving 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. And taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution. And pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I might add, we made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers, more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as I've been doing by taking executive action on police reform and calling for it to be the law of the land. Directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession, because no one should be jailed for simply using or having it on their record. Take on crimes of domestic violence. I'm ramping up the Federal Enforcement of the Violence Against Women Act that I proudly wrote when I was a senator. So we can finally, finally end the scourge against women in America. There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, whose nine-year-old sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message. So everyone in this room, in this chamber, could hear the same message. 
the constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House, that the Vice President is leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oh. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There's his quote, just get over it. I say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent People, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also... <clears throat> work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a... <coughs> Excuse me, Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards, under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> this war... has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly two million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin. Families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more, something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary 
appear will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> and Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to cross, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this. Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. And I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees that Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. There's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I build a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander in Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <clears throat> For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America's falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America's rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up, our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I've revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. But there's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? <laughs> pass bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. Harness. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <clears throat> That's why the song support and help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act. One of the most significant laws ever. Helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home, but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it. And we will.
Let me close with this. Yeah. I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces and the battle for the soul of our nation. Between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born in mid-World War II, when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, cure, a career in service. I left the law firm and became a public defender because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29. Then vice president or our first black president. Now president to the first women vice president. In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they're going to let me on ascended elevators for votes sometimes. They're not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are, it's how old are our ideas. Yeah. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. Yeah. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. You lead America, the land of possibilities. You need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Yeah. Tonight you've heard mine. I see a future where defending democracy you don't diminish it. I see a future where we restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. I see a future where the middle class has finally has a fair shot and the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. I see a future where we save the planet from the climate crisis and our country from gun violence. Above all, I see a future for all Americans. I see a country for all Americans. And I will always be president for all Americans. Because I believe in America. I believe in you, the American people. You're the reason we've never been more optimistic about our future than I am now. So let's build the future together. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. God bless you all.
And may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. President Biden addressing the joint session of Congress in the State of the Union, the final one of this term. A vision for the future and also an argument for four more years, a chant that was heard by Democrats throughout the speech, which lasted a little over an hour, hour and nine minutes. It was energetic and optimistic. And the president clearly trying to draw a contrast with the individual he called his predecessor on many, many occasions, never by name. But everyone knows who he meant, his opponent in this next election, Donald Trump. Not a lot of preamble in his speech. He went right at it. Um, first talking about freedom and democracy under attack, talking about uh, January 6th, the lies he says that pose a threat to U.S. democracy, um, speaking truth uh, to January 6th lies. And he says, you can't love your country only when you lose. And then went on into uh, Roe v. Wade. Only when you win, exactly. Only and it, it seems like he wanted to start this with the, the theme of democracy, that democracy itself is under attack overseas and here at home. He had a, a muscular set of comments for Vladimir Putin, talking tough against the Russian leader. Why don't we uh, listen, listen to a little bit of this conversation? <laughs> In any event, talking about democracy, it's happened abroad, but also here at home, mentioning January 6th, very high up in the speech. And, and there was some heckling and some give and uh, take between uh, Republicans and the president. He seemed to relish those moments, seemed to be expecting those moments, I think you could, you could probably fairly say, and parried a little bit. Uh, with Republicans in the crowd. And as for the elephant in the room, and that is not a partisan statement, his age, he took it on, uh, and there has been so much talk about his age, whether at 81 years old, he is up to the job. This is something that voters will be deciding, that voters have expressed concern about. He took on the issue, saying, in essence, I may be old, but I have experience and I have wisdom. And he contrasted with he said other people his same age, referring not so subtly to Donald Trump, when he laid out a vision, he says, of America that is optimistic. And he tried to contrast with former President Trump saying he is laying out a vision of America that is dark and destitute. He's trying to turn what is his biggest political liability right now into an asset. He's trying to make the case that with time comes wisdom and that he's the best person to lead this country into the future. We know that about three quarters of Americans have concerns about the president's age and his fitness for office, including about half of his own party. And what was interesting to watch the way Democrats were reacting to the president's speech. I will give you a sense of some text I'm getting from, from in the room, words like combative, fiery, robust from Democrats, a Democratic lawmaker in there who's says that's exactly what he this person wanted to see from the president tonight as yes this is a formal speech with the trappings of the presidency but it's also coming as we've talked about as the kickoff to the general election and, and Kristen Walker let's let's talk a little bit about one of the big topics tonight immigration it's, it's something that has weighed this candidacy down he comes out tonight and turns it on its ear and says it's Republicans is that, is that gonna fly with Americans who have for weeks and months watch the crowds coming across the border have watched their cities transform as we see more migrants well it might he's effectively taking a page out of the playbook of a Harry Truman who ran against the do-nothing Congress. And that's what we saw this president do tonight, effectively saying we had a bipartisan bill on the table. It was scrapped at the direction of Donald Trump. And that is energizing for the Democratic base. We'll have to see if it helps him win over some of those independents. He did hold up that pin. He said her name. Of course, that's what Republicans Marjorie Taylor Greene were urging him to do about Lake and Riley. Uh, of course, that nursing school student who was killed by someone who did come into the country illegally. And of course, there's some question about whether he got her name right, but it was a defiant moment, Savannah and Lester. And I'm hearing from Democrats, one person telling me this was a total 10. 
So that's how they're responding. So immigration is a big issue, and it's risen to the top of many voters' concern list. The economy, the perennial issue that voters care about. Christine Romans, our senior business correspondent, with us. What did you make? What did you hear in this speech from the president? He had a, a new line I hadn't heard before, turning setback into comeback, as he was describing the American economy. And I think more Americans are starting to maybe agree with him on that. And that might be a reason why other issues are now rising to the top of the polls and the economy is starting to slip a little bit in terms of top of mind. Um, he's also appealing to the American electorate that, look, I'm there with you at your kitchen table. I'm trying to cut costs. I don't think the tax system is fair. I don't think billionaires should have a lower tax rate than you do. And he's really just trying to appeal to them on that front. He never mentioned the stock market, which is interesting to me, um, because his predecessor was notorious for taking credit for the stock market. This president knows he cannot do that. That would be tone deaf. But he, he stayed away from that. But he also talked about these, you talk about kitchen table things, shrinkflation, right. the, uh, uh, the overfeeification, that's my term, uh, <laughs> in, in this case, uh, of, of the country. He talked about, you know, capping uh, late fees, uh, the things that really directly affect And drug costs and insulin. I mean, he lowered insulin, you know, they lowered insulin costs on his watch, and he wants to do that for all Americans. He wants to expand how Medicare can negotiate with drug companies, um, and that is something that really, really appeals to people. I mean, we have the highest health care costs in the world here in the United States, and the United States is a big customer, and he wants to leverage that. He, he mentioned several times how he's a capitalist, and he thinks people should be able to get rich if they want to get rich, um, but he really thinks that you can uh, turn the tables on debt and deficits in this country by tapping into the people and the companies uh, to pay more. Well, the campaign clearly believes that anytime you go after billionaires paying 8% in taxes when others are paying a factor, a multitude of that, that that's a winning argument for them. Let's talk about how it was in the room. Ryan Nobles, our Capitol Hill correspondent, is there as the president makes the slow walk out of the chamber, seeming to shake every hand that wants to shake his, and greeting old colleagues in the Senate. Ryan, we know that Speaker Johnson had instructed his conference not to uh, not to lose their decorum. I think decorum was the word he used. How was it in the room? Well, I don't know how well it translated on television, Savannah, but inside this room, partisanship was on full display. You know, normally in a State of the Union, there's at least a couple of beats that a president can hit that would lead to both sides of the chamber standing uh, in, in applause. Other than when the president entered the room and one other moment where he was talking about the late John Lewis and the survivors that were here in the room uh, from the Selma Bloody Sunday attack, Republicans were sitting on their hands for this entire speech, even during sections of the speech where you'd think that they may have rallied uh, to support some of the things that the president was talking about. For instance, support for Ukraine. There's a lot of Republicans that believe that uh, support should continue for Ukraine. The issue of IVF, where many of these Republican members have come out and strongly said that they were in support of IVF, despite what they saw uh, play out in Alabama. Even in those moments, you saw many of these Republican members kind of look at each other, uh, clap maybe half-heartedly or just not clap at all. They just seem to be uncomfortable with any levels of support for anything that President Biden was saying. But in terms of the heckling, there was certainly a degree of it. At one point, one member in the back yelled, you lied, or lies, I should say, in relation uh, to something that uh, President Biden was talking about, his predecessor, uh, former President Trump. And then, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, at multiple instances throughout the speech, uh, attempted to make a spectacle of herself. It was that moment, it was, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene confronting the president where he mentioned the name of Lake and Riley and held up the pin with her name on it. But you, you certainly saw a level of preparation from Joe Biden in this room. He seemed ready to take on any challenge that could come from a protester or a heckler in the audience. At one point, there was another heckler that was removed from the gallery. The president didn't even acknowledge that that protest was taking place. So he was clearly prepared for any sort of disruption in the cadence of his speech. It never seemed uh, to throw him off at any stage. And he seemed to enjoy it. He seemed to enjoy engaging with Republicans at different points in the speech uh, and trying to get across the point that he was attempting to make. So uh, I don't think there's any doubt that a lot of us felt a level of tension before the speech started because of these concerns over how the speech could be interrupted. 
uh, those tension seemed to kind of fade away as the speech continued to go on and the president demonstrated that he'd be able to handle whatever was thrown his way. All right, Ryan, thanks very much. Uh, let's bring in former Obama campaign manager David Plouffe. We also have editor and CEO of The Dispatch, Stephen Hayes. Uh, David, let me first start with you. There was obviously a lot of nail-biting among Democrats going into this evening, not knowing what to expect. And that, that leads me to wonder where the bar was, and in your view, how did the president do against that bar? Well, Lester, I think for Democrats writ large, they're going to be pretty enthused by this speech. Uh, I think it was one of the strongest performances Joe Biden's had, and I think performance probably mattered more than the substance. There was energy there. There was vigor. He took the fight to the Republicans and to Trump where that was appropriate. So I don't expect wholesale changes amongst the whole electorate, but I think the base, you know, which has been concerned about these polls, uh, concerns about age, my guess is he'll go a long way, not all the way, but a long way to settling that down. Uh, and of course, it was probably one of the biggest direct audiences he'll have uh, until the first debate, assuming we have one. So it was important from that standpoint as well. We've got Stephen Hayes here as well. He's an uh, NBC News contributor, a Republican. Stephen, what do you make of this speech? And do you think it reached across the aisle? If there are swing voters, that tiny, ever tinier sliver of Americans who are persuadable when we have both sides of the, of the partisan divide so polarized and so calcified in their positions. Did you think that President Biden reached across to try to bring more people into his coalition or was this a speech for the base? Yeah, I agree with David. I think this was very much a speech to the base. The president made a couple of references to his unity agenda, but there really wasn't much in his unity agenda that would bring Republicans along. I thought he had a difficult time trying to make the case that the country is strong. He said the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. He ended with sort of a flourish of optimism, saying he's optimistic about the future. But it seems to contrast with the central message of his campaign, which is that democracy is at stake. The former president, he mentioned his predecessor 13 times, is an existential threat to the continued existence of the United States. So there's some tension between what he said in this speech tonight that I think sought to please the base and what he's saying more broadly in his campaign. All right, let's go to Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel right now. He is in Amman, Jordan, uh, watching this. Uh, Richard, you, your thoughts about the president's comments regarding Israel and his, his conversations with the Israeli leadership? So he made an announcement today saying that soon the U.S. military would be leading an effort to open this temporary pier in Gaza so that large shipments of aid could be uh, brought to the people of Gaza. That is expected to be a process that is going to take several weeks to construct and could take several months to get up and running properly. But uh, it will bring much more relief to the 2.3 million people of Gaza. Uh, right now, very little aid is getting in because Israel has sealed Gaza off as it continues to conduct its military campaign to drive Hamas from power and free hostages. And a lot, some of the aid that is going in now is being airdropped. And I was on one of those airdrops earlier today. That's why I'm in Jordan. The airdrops are being uh, orchestrated from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And I saw how useful those airdrops are on one level, because at least they're able to get something to Gaza, but it is not nearly enough. A, uh, a, a sea lift would be far more uh, effective. but. Uh, people here in the region uh, are wondering, is there going to be a long-term solution as well? Can uh, the U.S. push its ally, Israel, to come to a ceasefire? All right. Richard Engel, thank you. We are awaiting the president's exit from the chamber where he's just delivered his State of the Union address. And a few moments after that, we will hear from the Republicans, the official response given by Senator Katie Britt of Alabama. That is forthcoming. I want to turn to our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett, who's watching along with us. And what an extraordinary moment tonight between the president and the members of the Supreme Court who were there in the audience. Laura, this was an ad-libbed moment when he was talking about the decision there decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and he said in that decision you question whether you, you state that women have political power and he said to the justices you're about to find out how much that was a moment 
a, a striking one, Savannah, as that a direct confrontation um, with the Supreme Court sitting right there. Obviously, um, it's a court that has a solid conservative majority, thanks to former President Donald Trump, his predecessor. And Joe Biden went right at them on probably the most controversial decision over the last generation, which, of course, is the overturning of Roe versus Wade and Dobbs. And he's quoting their own language from the Dobbs decision back to them. But then, as you mentioned, ad-libbing um, a, a much more pointed and, frankly, uh, aggressive comment about the political backlash that we have seen from Dobbs. And it's a theme, I think, that we saw him do so early in the speech. It was only a couple minutes in that the whole issue of abortion and reproductive freedom and IVF, which obviously has sort of dominated the news cycle over the last month, to do it so early in the speech was obviously a choice and a signaling of priorities. And he wants to make the connection from the fall of Roe to the jeopardizing of IVF that we've seen in Alabama so pointedly and that the nation has had such a visceral reaction to, Savannah. All right, Laura, thank you. All right, we want to bring in our chief White House correspondent, Peter Alexander. Peter, we continue to watch the president who continues to shake hands and talk. He obviously enjoys uh, the give and take here. What are you hearing from within the White House circle in terms of their review of how he did tonight? You know, Lester, I could hear it for myself standing outside the West Wing. There was cheering and applause as the president was speaking tonight. The White House feels very good about where they are right now and where they are going in the weeks ahead, with the president set to have an aggressive schedule of campaigning, as it's described to me, beginning tomorrow with travel to Pennsylvania. He'll head out of town again this weekend to Georgia, and he's going to be on the road a lot over the course of the next several weeks. Lester, one moment that I heard while you were speaking to the audience uh, with all of our colleagues just moments ago from the Democrat Jerry Nadler to the president as Nadler greeted President Biden. He said, no one's going to call you cognitively impaired. Now the president recognizing the urgency of this moment, the opportunity to try to deliver a performance that would satisfy the concerns of some Americans who have had questions about his mental and physical health. The White House and certainly a lot of Democratic allies I'm hearing from right now believe the president uh, more than met that bar. All right, uh, Peter Alexander, that was one of the questions I posed a moment ago. What is the bar? Because there, were this, there was this nervousness among, uh, among Democrats as to how he would do, um, spin the elephant in the room, frankly. Um, but he obviously feels he did well as he uh, uh, takes his time. You can almost hear the collective exhale and I, I, I dare say almost glee from the Democrats that were in the building to see that punch and that feistiness in this speech. In just a moment we'll be back and we will have the Republican response to President Biden's State of the Union address delivered by the 42 year old Senator from Alabama Katie Britt. That's coming up after these messages.
Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Well, they haven't quite turned out the lights or started mopping the floor, uh, but the president may be the last one in the room here as he continues to press the flesh. Uh, welcome back to our coverage of the president's State of the Union address. Yes, and we await any moment now Alabama Senator Katie Britt, who will deliver the Republican response. Lester, back in the 80s, then Senator Biden gave the Democratic response when he was in his 40s. Now let's see Senator Britt. Good evening, America. My name is Katie Britt, and I have the honor of serving the people of the great state of Alabama and the United States Senate. However, that's not the job that matters most. I am a proud wife and mom of two school-aged kids. My daughter Bennett and my son Ridgeway are why I ran for the Senate. I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. And uh, what we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. One thing was quite clear though, President Biden just doesn't get it. He's out of touch. Under his administration, families are worse off, our communities are less safe, and our country is less secure. I just wish he understood what real families are facing around kitchen tables just like this one. You know, this is where our family has tough conversations. It's where we make hard decisions. It's where we share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our days. It's where we laugh together. And it's where we hold each other's hands and pray for God's guidance. And many nights, to be honest, it's where Wesley and I worry. I know we're not alone. And so tonight, the American family needs to have a tough conversation. Because the truth is, we're all worried about the future of our nation. The country we know and love seems to be slipping away, and it feels like the next generation will have fewer opportunities and less freedoms than we did. I worry my own children may not even get a shot at living their American dreams. My American dream allowed me, the daughter of two small business owners from rural enterprise Alabama, to be elected to the United States Senate at the age of 40. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio, I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across to just one generation, in just one lifetime, it's truly breathtaking. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families are hurting. Our country can do better. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis, he invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. 
The cartels put her on a mattress in a shoebox of a room, and they sent men through that door over and over again for hours and hours on end. We wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. This is the United States of America, and it is past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. <sighs> From fentanyl poisonings to horrific murders, there are empty chairs tonight at kitchen tables just like this one because of President Biden's senseless border policies. Just think about Lake and Riley. In my neighboring state of Georgia, this beautiful 22-year-old nursing student went out on a jog one morning, but she never got the opportunity to return home. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers President Biden chose to release into our homeland. Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And tonight, President Biden finally said her name. But he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Mr. President, enough is enough. Innocent Americans are dying, and you only have yourself to blame. Fulfill your oath of office, reverse your policies, end this crisis, and stop the suffering. Sadly, we know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. His reckless spending dug our economy into a hole and sent the cost of living through the roof. We have the worst inflation in 40 years and the highest credit card debt in our nation's history. Let that sink in. Hardworking families are struggling to make ends meet today and with soaring mortgage rates and sky high childcare cost, they're also struggling to how to plan for tomorrow. The American people are scraping by while President Biden proudly proclaims that Bidenomics is working. Goodness, y'all, bless his heart, we know better. I'll never forget stopping at a gas station in Shelton County one evening. The gentleman working the counter told me that after retiring, he had to pick up a job in his 70s so that he didn't have to choose between going hungry or going without his medication. He said, I, I did everything right. I did everything I was told to do. I worked hard, I saved, I was responsible. He's not alone. I hear similar concerns from fellow parents, whether I am walking with my friends, or whether I'm at my kids' games. But let's be honest, it's been a minute since Joe Biden pumped gas, uh, ran a carpool, or even pushed a grocery cart. Meanwhile, the rest of us see our dollar, and we know it doesn't go as far. We see it every day. And despite what he tells you, our communities, are not safer. For years, the left has coddled criminals and defunded the police, all while letting repeat offenders walk free. The result is tragic, but foreseeable. From our small towns to America's most iconic city streets, life is getting more and more dangerous. 
And unfortunately, President Biden's weakness isn't just hurting families here at home. He is making us a punchline on the world stage. Look, where I'm from, your word is your bond. But for three years, the president has demonstrated that America's word doesn't mean what it used to. From abandoning our allies in his disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan to desperately pushing another dangerous deal with Iran. President Biden has failed. We've become a nation in retreat. And the enemies of freedom, they see an opportunity. Putin's brutal aggression in Europe has put our allies on the brink. Iran's terrorist proxies have slaughtered Israeli Jews and American citizens. They've targeted commercial shipping, and they've attacked our troops nearly 200 times since October, killing three U.S. soldiers and two Navy SEALs. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland, spying on our military installations, and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, it conquers America. And what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look, we all recall when presidents faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are actually the cornerstones of a great nation. Just ask yourself, are you better off now than you were three years ago? There's no doubt we're at a crossroads and it doesn't have to be this way. We all feel it. But here's the good news. We, the people, are still in the driver's seat. We get to decide whether our future will grow brighter or whether we'll settle for an America in decline. Well, I know which choice our children deserve, and I know the choice the Republican Party is fighting for. We are the party of hard-working parents and families, and we want to give you and your children the opportunities to thrive. And we want families to grow it's why we strongly support continued nationwide access to in vitro fertilization. We want to help loving moms and dads bring precious life into this world. Wesley and I believe there is no greater blessing in life than our children. And that's why tonight I want to make a direct appeal to the parents out there, and in particular to my fellow moms many of whom I know will be up tossing and turning at 2 a.m., wondering how you're going to be in three places at once and then somehow still get dinner on the table. First of all, we see you, we hear you, and we stand with you. I know you're frustrated. 
I know you're probably disgusted by most of what you see going on in Washington, and I'll be really honest with you, you're not wrong for feeling that way. Look, I get it. The task in front of us isn't an easy one, but I can promise you one thing. It is worth it. So I am asking you for the sake of your kids and your grandkids, get into the arena. Every generation has been called to do hard things. American greatness rests in the fact that we always answer that call. It's who we are. Never forget, we are steeped in the blood of patriots who overthrew the most powerful empire in the world. We walk in the footsteps of pioneers who tamed the wild. We now carry forward the same flame of freedom as the liberators of an oppressed Europe. We continue to draw courage from those who bent the moral arc of the universe. And when we gaze upon the heavens, never forget that our DNA contains the same ingenuity that put man on the moon. America has been tested before, and every single time we've emerged unbowed and unbroken. Our history has been written with the grit of men and women who got knocked down. But we know their stories because they did not stay down. We are here because they stood back up. So now it's our turn, our moment to stand up and prove ourselves worthy of protecting the American dream. Together, we can reawaken the heroic spirit of a great nation. Because America, we don't just have a rendezvous with destiny. We take destiny's hand and we lead it. Our future starts around kitchen tables just like this, with moms and dads just like you. And you are why I believe with every fiber of my being that despite the current state of our union, our best days are still ahead. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless these United States of America. That was Alabama Senator Katie Britt delivering the Republican response to President Biden's State of the Union address while he was still in the chamber. Senator Britt criticized him, saying that she and many others are worried about the future of America. She especially blasted his handling of the border and painted this moment as a crossroads for America. I'm talking about the split screen. There's a reason, of course, that she's considered one of the rising stars in the Senate and in Alabama politics. Alabama obviously at the center of this IVF controversy after that Alabama Supreme Court ruling uh, that threw into question whether or not people could have IVF and shut down clinics in that state, something that the state legislature is trying to rectify. I want to turn to Hallie Jackson. When you talk about the split screen, she's 42 years old. Literally almost half of the president's age. She's sitting in a kitchen saying, I'm a mom, talking about kitchen table issues. This is what the Republicans are hoping to get across tonight. The big push relatability from her and ma trying to match President Biden's optimism there. You heard, for, in most part, an optimistic tone. She did, of course, turn on immigration and cast it as a dark moment for America, um, which is something that Republicans have been going after the president for for months now. You heard the president in his speech try to flip the script, pointing to what Congress could do in order to make the border more secure and has not so far. This is going to continue to be a theme into November. And it's really important, I think, to also talk about part of why she was chosen, because she represents the state of Alabama, Savannah, and that court ruling that you just mentioned, immediate backlash to that. IVF enjoys broad support from across the political spectrum. It is not a Republican issue. It is not a Democrat issue. And you heard her mention the need to push for continued access to IVF. Notable that when President Biden mentioned it at the Capitol tonight in his State of the Union speech, it's the first time that 
the words IVF have ever been said in a State of the Union. It's a real sign of the times, and it's a sign of the issues uh, that Democrats are continuing to push you forward. You really get a sense tonight that we've seen the vision of two Americas, really. You're talking about the same thing, with, but, but we just see striking different visions. Uh, of, of what this country looks like. Yeah, and that's the next eight months of our lives because this is, as we've been talking about, the beginning of the general election here with Donald Trump as a presumptive Republican nominee, President Biden looking to win back the White House here, and two very different takes on what the next four years could look like. Right, Hallie Jackson, thank you so much to our entire team watching the State of the Union tonight. As mentioned, uh, we will continue to have coverage on NBC News Now. Our colleague Kristen Welker is ready to pick up the coverage. We will have much more tomorrow morning on today. We're going to get up nice and early with me, Lester. You know I'm always up. And of course, maybe not in a tie. Yes, on nightly <laughs> news as well. All right, I'm Lester Holt for Savannah Guthrie and all of us here at NBC News in Washington. Good night. Thank you for watching. Live from Washington, this is NBC News Now coverage of the State of the Union. Here's Kristen Welker. Welcome to NBC News Now special coverage of the 2024 State of the Union Address. I am Kristen Welker in Washington, where President Biden just wrapped up his remarks before a joint session of Congress. The stakes incredibly high heading into tonight as the president faces growing scrutiny about his age, public frustrations with the economy, a crisis at the southern border and divisions inside his own party over the war between Israel and Hamas. All of it coming as the president battles low approval ratings and gears up for another presidential race against former President Donald Trump, who is now the Republican Party's presumptive nominee. In his address tonight, the president didn't shy away from going right at Mr. Trump more than a dozen times in his remarks, hitting him on everything from the January 6th breach of the Capitol to abortion and the border. My predecessor, a former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. My predecessor and many in this chamber I want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. My predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels the political win, he viewed it as a, it would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me telling the Congress to pass it. Also notable how President Biden began his remarks, echoing the themes of his 2020 campaign that democracy itself is under threat. My purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom of democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas. The president also engaging with Republicans in the audience on the issue of the southern border, calling on them to pass the bipartisan border bill that died in the Senate last month while placing the blame squarely on former President Trump. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. And on the war in the Middle East, the president announced an emergency mission to establish a port to get more humanitarian aid to Palestinians suffering in Gaza while criticizing the Israeli government. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza and ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to call, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this: humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. 
Following his remarks tonight, Republican, tonight's Republican response was delivered by freshman Alabama Senator Katie Britt, one of the youngest serving senators. She responded to President Biden full of emotion, attacking him on everything from the border to the economy and foreign policy, ultimately criticizing his fitness for office. What we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are actually the cornerstones of a great nation. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is NBC's Ryan Nobles. Ryan was inside the chamber during the president's State of the Union address. Ryan, take us inside. What stood out to you tonight? Kristen, the thing I was most struck by was just how much partisanship was on display inside of that chamber. It's not out of the ordinary for Republicans to not cheer for a Democratic president and for Democrats to cheer loudly for a Democratic president. But usually during a speech like this, you see opportunities for both sides to come together and stand and applaud with a common goal. And those moments were just so few and far between in this speech. Uh, you can partly blame that on the president for maybe not showing up enough reasons for Republicans to clap, but you could also blame it on Republicans who seem to go out of their way to sit on their hands and just find nothing uh, that they could find, they could connect with in this Biden speech. Uh, in fact, by my count, the only time that you saw Republicans stand and applaud was the moment the president came into the room. And then during that period of time where President Biden was talking about the late John Lewis, and then he honored the, the survivors of the Selma Bloody Sunday attack, uh, they did stand and applaud at that point. But there were numerous other opportunities where you'd expect Republicans to at least show some level of support with, with, with what President Biden was talking about. For instance, this issue of IVF, which so many of these Republican members of Congress have rushed to defend and say they support and have presented legislation to that end. When President Biden talked about his support for IVF, you saw many of these members kind of look at each other, not know whether or not they should clap, and most of them chose not to. And then, of course, there is the situation with Ukraine. Obviously, the supplemental aid package is something that there has been a lot of controversy about. Uh, there is a relatively small faction of House Republicans that are kind of holding this legislation from making its way to the floor. But it's our belief that most Republicans, in fact, the majority of Republicans in both in the House and the Senate, do believe that the United States needs, needs to continue to support Ukraine and also believe that there's a huge concern that Russia could overtake Ukraine. But yet you saw very few Republicans clapping in support of President Biden's commitment to defend Ukraine long term. So. You know, uh, Kristen, I don't have to tell you, this does seem to be the era that we are living in, this hyper-partisanship. It's only on even more of a display because there is such a thin margin between Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate. Uh, but if we were looking for moments of unity in this speech here tonight, at least the way it played out, uh, it was very difficult to find them. Kristen. You're absolutely right. And President Biden himself, for his part, right off the bat, starting with some of his biggest lines to fire up the base, talking about uh, Ukraine January 6th, uh, as well as reproductive rights right from the start. Ryan Nobles, thank you so much for your great reporting all night long. Really appreciate it. Let's go now to the White House and check in with NBC News White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez. So, Gabe, how is the White House responding tonight? I've been getting texts from Democrats who are relieved. They are ebullient, quite frankly. One person telling me they thought this was a perfect 10. What are you hearing? Uh, yeah, Kristen, and hearing many of the same things. One source close to the campaign telling me that they thought it was a feisty speech and they thought that the president more than cleared the bar. Now, Kristen, as you were just saying, uh, President Biden, you know, really taking on Republicans more directly on some issues, certainly over reproductive rights, over uh, foreign policy, and also uh, talking about taxes as well. But with that clash on, on immigration, the president heckled by some Republicans, 
Republican members, including, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene, coming back and, and saying uh, the name of Lake and Riley, that young woman in Georgia who was murdered uh, allegedly by an undocumented worker. The president saying her name, although mispronouncing her first name, but still uh, Republicans saying, or excuse me, Democrats saying that the president really was taking on Republicans on this issue that, as you know, Kristen, over the last several years, Democrats have been reluctant to really take on immigration. They are now trying to flip the script. And the president coming back and really saying that it is because of House Republicans that this border security fund uh, bill was not passed. Also in foreign policy, Kristen, and it came as there were protesters here right outside of the White House and also right outside the Capitol uh, who were protesting the president's uh, handling of the Israel-Hamas war. The president announcing that temporary port that is to be constructed uh, in Gaza, the, an emergency mission led by the U.S. military. Still a lot of questions, though, about how it will all play out in the coming weeks. Uh, but the president putting that in the speech and trying to tell those who criticize his approach to the Israel-Hamas war that he's doing the best he can to get humanitarian aid in. Now, Kristen, the president now will embark on a, a, a travel blitz over the next uh, coming weeks in Pennsylvania tomorrow, Georgia on Saturday, several other cabinet members trying to sell his agenda. And the White House really looking at this and saying that two days after Super Tuesday, this State of the Union address was certainly a great way to sell that agenda, Kristen. Yeah, the starting gun to 2024 went off tonight. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much for your great reporting. We have much more special coverage of the 2024 State of the Union Address still ahead. Stay with us. You know America's coming back is because of you, our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are, it's how old are our ideas. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas and only take us back. Welcome back. Joining me now on set is NBC News Chief Political Analyst Chuck Todd and NBC's Chief Washington and Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell. Thanks to both of you for staying up it's working the night shift with me. It's great to have you both. Chuck, let's start with you. What were your key takeaways? It felt like a campaign speech right off the bat. I got to check where we are. Are we in Chicago? Is this the Democratic <laughs> Convention? If, you, if this was the acceptance speech, you'd have been like, I mean, to hear a chant of four more years. Yeah. Look, yeah. Um, if you were to sit here in the pre-Trump era, this speech would have been considered overheated, too partisan. Mm. He didn't speak to all Americans. He only spoke to his face. But we're living in a different world, right? Donald Trump changed all the rules, the tone and tenor of American politics has changed to the point where 
Biden's performance was almost that's what you're supposed to do now, right? Yeah. That was so. Look, he did. You know you, the phrase that you're going to hear a lot of. He did what he had to do, right? Yeah. He had to do. He had to perform well. He he absolutely performed well. I I found it to be a surprise at first how right off the bat. Yes. He took on Trump immediately, and so they made the decision. Look, everybody else is going to treat this like a campaign speech, so why don't we do mm. the same? So look, as a tactic. Uh, for framing the start of this general election, I have a feeling the speech is going to be his stump speech for at least, probably at least through the convention. Yeah. Um, this is it's probably going to be very effective. I think you're going to have some people uncomfortable with the tone in the middle, but I think this is going to rally his troops, and he needed to rally his troops tonight. Andrea, what were your takeaways? He took on the age issue there head on. But I was really struck by how energetic he was, mm -hmm. feisty, mm -hmm. forceful, mixing it up, you know, engaging the, the few hecklers, engaging Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Greene, who tried to confront him on the walk-in. Like he was beating. He almost wanted hecklers, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. he was so comfortable in that chamber. He was in his element. Mm. Now, a set piece and teleprompters and all of that, but he went off prompter, you know, stumbled a little bit there. But I thought it was one of the best speeches he's ever delivered. And I was really impressed, frankly, that he started out not with the State of the Union is this or that or the other. He started out with, Dealing with Ukraine, he went yeah. right for it. And th that was, to me, going for the big picture. Going is that the for John Meacham touch, you think? Starting well, in 1941, for FDR. We know Meacham yes. has been in the room. Yes. It was actually, and it's like, that it was, was the, I couldn't tell where Meacham had any input well, except at the beginning. That, I gotta tell you that it was Michael Meacham Beschloss touch. today yes. who started out, uh, you know, on our program mm -hmm. at noon yeah. with. 1941, Four mm. Freedoms, right. and FDR. And so when that came back, it sounded very much like the right frame mm -hmm. that Putin's on the march, and it was Reagan-esque. That, that contrast between Putin and, of course, how former President Trump has spoken about Putin, yes, and dealt with Putin. Um, we do have that Marjorie Taylor Greene moment. Let's just play it, and then get your reaction on the other side. All right. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. Chuck, he fumbled her first name a little bit. Her name yeah, is Link, Link, yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln Riley. Riley. Lincoln Riley is the head coach of USC football, um, which but, is, was weird to hear that at first. And I have to admit, as a football fan, I'm like, wait. <laughs> Did he say Lincoln Riley? Right, but we had to go was back and check. Term yeah. Illegal, but he was really quoting yeah. her. But many people, yeah. you know, were offended, thinking that. But let's he was go back big picture here. Illegal, rather than the speaking of my undocumented. Would you have expected the Democrats to start chanting "pass the bill" for a bill that six months ago not a one of them would have signed on to? Right. I mean, it is remarkable mm -hmm. how negative partisanship now works. Here was like, okay, you guys said no to this bill. This is the bill you wanted. Well, now we want it. Right. I mean, it, it's, I mean, you sit and, there, if you're James Langford, you're like, look what we're getting them to do. They're now cheering for more border and security. In fact, right. Lang James Langford was mouthing, that's right, yes. when he yes. listed right. the ingredients right. of the bill in yes. contrast to the Republican talking points, which were that none of the good stuff, as they call it, you know, was in that bill. But it did have conservative principles in it. And he had gone very far over to the center or to the right. I think this is one of the most fascinating moments because this Democrats did not have a path to citizenship in the bill. Donald Trump scuttled the bill effectively. This was basically his moment of calling out a do-nothing Congress. And it was, it was interesting also that the speaker, watching the speaker was fascinating because he doesn't have a mean face. You know, he's a boyish I, I, I young sort of guy. Felt a lot, sorry for, I don't think and, he knew what to do up there at times. Well, and you I know, feel there bad. were times yeah. when he was almost smiling like on preschool education, early childhood education, yeah. which is, Or how about you know, clapping where nobody saw him? You <laughs> would see you like he would clap, hands, like, yes, yes, but I don't know if I'm supposed to show that I'm clapping. <laughs> so he didn't have the mean face, but, you know, Israel and Gaza, yes. you now it was, more than, it was 52 minutes, 54 minutes before he actually got to that. But he did that. announce this new policy, getting well, more aid now, into Gaza. Well, that's where I have a problem with it, because I've got to fact check it. Mm -hmm. Because 
The UN spoke out in a briefing just yesterday about the fact that there is already a peer. They don't need to build a peer. Mm. Why not use the peer that's there? Well, it's an Israeli peer, and Israel hasn't agreed to it. That's why not. And why use that road? There is, you know, a crossing that Secretary Blinken has been urging them to use in northern Israel into northern Gaza, and uh, rather, you know, from Israel right into northern Gaza, rather, and. Why go in through Karen Shalom, which is the existing mm. opening in the south? I have to drive up this way. And the UN then is in northern Gaza without any help getting the aid to the people who need it. It's not a good process. It won't get massive aid in. It's not as they are trying to sell it. It's, Andrea, it's such important context. And Chuck, it speaks to how complicated this issue is and how fraught for President Biden and the fact that Democrats are very divided. They wanted him to forcefully call for a ceasefire tonight. Yeah. He didn't go that far. No, he didn't. And it's it's been interesting to see that the vice president did and he didn't. Right. right? There's been this, it's almost like they, they're they okay with letting the, the, the West Wing look as divided as congressional Democrats are. Right. But, you know, this is one of those things where if the role, if Biden was further to the side of the Palestinians, I actually think he'd have a bigger political problem. Mm. Right. As problematic as this is for him in the state of Michigan. And it's not I'm not going to sit here and say it is not. This is. And I also believe that if this is a hot war in the fall, this is mm. bigger than just worrying about but Michigan. He only spent, he spent so, less than five minutes on it and it was buried in the speech. And I think that's the way they dealt is that with a it. Problem? Well, because he's rallying the base. Well, I think. Right? No, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's something that they don't really want to talk about because he doesn't have a solution and they haven't. I mean, they've tried. Yeah. And, you know, Bill Burns is there right now trying to work on it. Yeah. He's in the region. Yeah. All right, Andrea, Chuck, thank you all so right, much. So really good to be with you. It's so you. good to, we could keep this going all night. Thank you. Coming up, looking at the Democratic side of the House chamber tonight, where dozens of Democratic women dressed in white in a show of support for women's rights. One of those Democratic lawmakers, Congresswoman Judy Chu, will join me on set next with her message and her response to the president's big speech. Stay with us. You're watching NBC News Now special coverage of the State of the Union Address. The Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. <laughs> Guarantee the right to IVF. Guarantee it nationwide. And welcome back to our special coverage of tonight's State of the Union Address. Joining me now on set is California Democratic Congresswoman Judy Chu. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, I have to just ask you, you heard one of the fiery remarks about uh, preserving IVF access nationwide. What did you make of the president's speech tonight? I was so ecstatic that he talked about reproductive freedom right at the start. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually had 40 of our guests uh, all on the issues of reproductive rights, whether mm. it was IVF or abortion providers or um, uh, patients that could not get access to uh, reproductive uh, medicine. And um, so it was our biggest turnout ever. Wow. And so for him to acknowledge it and to say that this was a key issue for Americans was just something we needed to hear. What do you make of uh, a lot of people heard this speech and said it sounded a lot like a campaign speech right off the bat. Do you accept that? Is that what you wanted to hear tonight? 
He said the things we wanted to hear. I was there in the audience. I could feel the energy as he was talking about the key issues that we needed to address. You know, he wants to move the country forward, and I think he communicated that aggressively, vigorously, energetically. That's what we wanted to hear. Let me get you to respond to the Republican response. Katie Britt called the president, quote, dithering and diminished. I don't know if you had a chance to watch her entire speech, but how do you respond to that? Do you think the president did enough to answer those critics who have expressed concerns that, that he might be too old to serve another four years? We must have been watching a different speech. <laughs> I saw him being so direct about so many proposals, including new proposals on how to make a house more affordable, on getting um, 500 to prescription drugs uh, prices negotiated. Uh, he talked about uh, making the cap on prescription drugs for $2,000 for everybody. Mm. What do you make of that moment, that fiery moment that he had where he held up the pin and he said, I will say her name, Lake and Riley. Some people have noted he didn't quite get her name right, but really answering his critics who've said, say her name, and basically calling out Republicans for not passing the bipartisan deal that was struck in the Senate that never actually passed the Senate because Donald Trump encouraged Republicans to scuttle it. Well, he ad-libbed, <laughs> and I like that. I like the fact that he was mm. able to answer her back. Uh, he was on his toes, and I like the fact that he called out Republicans for being a do-nothing, even though they've been saying they wanted a border solution all this time. Yeah. Um, do you think that that message on immigration was enough to, obviously it energized Democrats, do you think it was enough to reach out and win over some of those Nikki Haley voters, some of those moderates, those independents who we might need to win re-election? Well, he was um, very strong in terms of talking about what needed to be done and uh, laid out those proposals in a vigorous manner. So I think I think he was uh, convincing on, on that issue. And uh, one thing's for sure, what's going on now isn't working. Mm. Let me ask you about what you heard on the Middle East. He obviously announced uh, the fact that they are going to move to get more aid mm -hmm. into Gaza. He called for and talked about the fact that they are working really hard to get this ceasefire, this temporary yeah. ceasefire in exchange for a release of hostages. He didn't go so far as the vice president has gone in calling for a permanent ceasefire. Did he go far enough for you? Well, he did call for a ceasefire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for now, and that is very important. I think he really needed to reinforce it, and people needed to hear him say that. Uh, this proposal for this, this temporary port um, uh, for the humanitarian aid, that was very intriguing. And I felt that uh, this is also something people needed to hear because they needed to hear what concrete measures there mm. would be that would actually get that aid into mm. the very desperate people of Gaza. I want to have you respond to your colleague, Congresswoman Jayapal, the chair, of course, of the Progressive Caucus, who told my Capitol Hill colleague that if Democrats lose this election, it will be because of their policy in the Middle East. What do you make of that? Do you think that's an accurate assessment? It is a very critical issue uh, that we need to address very seriously. And uh, I think people are looking for um, humanitarian aid into Gaza. They do not want to see starving children. Uh, yeah. They do not want to see indiscriminate bombing. Uh, it's got to stop. And uh, yes, we, Israel has a right to defend itself, but it must be much more targeted. Okay. Congresswoman Chu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your perspective tonight and for staying up late with us. We really appreciate it. Coming up next, we're going to turn to the other side of the aisle. Republican Congressman Byron Donalds will be here on set with me next. You're watching NBC News Now special coverage of the State of the Union Address. Do stay with us.
And welcome back. We heard from a Democratic member of Congress on President Biden's speech. Now let's turn to a Republican. Joining me now on set is Republican Congressman Byron Donalds of Florida. Congressman, thank you so much for being here. It's good to be with you. Good to be, have you here. Thank you for staying up late. Of course. Let me get your reaction to President Biden's State of the Union address. The, the Democrats are obviously standing and applauding. Uh, didn't see much <coughs> standing and applauding on the Republican side. Not a surprise. But what did you make of the speech? Well, it was highly partisan. Mm -hmm. And I think what the president was trying to do is rally his base, mm -hmm. but he didn't talk about the conditions of the country. He didn't really bring solutions for the conditions and the crises in the country. He talked mm -hmm. about things he wanted to do, but if you add up all of the laundry list, it would add another trillion to our annual deficits on top of the two trillion annual deficits under Joe Biden. How are the American people supposed to pay for this? He talks inflation. Everything he wants to do is only going to create more of it. You're talking about, for example, one of his proposals is actually to raise taxes on large corporations, on wealthy Americans, not touching taxes for anyone who makes $400,000. Why is that something that you disagree with? He says people who make more money should pay their fair share. Well, a couple of things. First of all, that didn't apply to his son because his son evaded taxes. Number two, if you start raising corporate taxes in a time where inflation is still high, you're actually going to depress economic growth in our country, not increase it. And number three, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that he referenced <laughs> in his speech has raised more revenue for the federal treasury, treasury than at any other time in American history. It actually has brought in record revenue to the federal government. We don't have a revenue problem. He we makes, have a spending problem. He makes the case that in many cases, millionaires and billionaires are paying a lower tax rate than teachers and people who are making a minimum wage. Let me play you what he said on Social sure. Security and get your reaction on that. Sure. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will. That's the proposal. Oh, no. You guys don't want another two trillion dollar tax cut. I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another two trillion dollars for the super wealth. That's good to hear. What do you make of that? A couple things. First of all, the president's gaslighting the American people. The Congressional Budget Office and OMB don't even agree with, with his numbers when it comes to tax policy that was written by Republicans, which has been successful for the country. But when it comes to Social Security, Republicans have brought no proposal about Social Security. But we do say that the CBO has said the program's going solvent in nine years. When they go and solve it, it will be a 22% benefit cut across the board for all seniors. So Congress does have to find a remedy to secure Social Security for the long run. What would you support? Would you support raising the retirement age, for example? Are you basically saying there do need to be reforms? Look, I think there's a lot of proposals that members of Congress have been debating and talking about. Yeah. The first part is you have to have a serious conversation with the American people, not a political conversation, because the results of Social Security going in insolvent are going to be disastrous for everyone. Right. Well, there's no doubt that that, that is a, a problem. The question is, what do you do about it? How do you keep it solvent? But le let me ask you about what you heard tonight on the border. The fact that President Biden effectively tried to paint Congress as a do-nothing Congress. He said, look, we had a bipartisan deal. And then Donald Trump came and said, don't accept this deal unless it's a perfect deal. It was a deal that Senator Lindsey Graham had praised. It was a deal that didn't include a pathway to citizenship. Does he have a point on that? No, he's wrong. And the reason why he's wrong is because when elements of that deal were being leaked out by somebody in the Senate, the Speaker of the House and House Republicans said that deal's dead on arrival in the House. You can finish negotiating it if you want to, but if the basic elements of allowing 5,000 illegal immigrants per day to come into the country before you take any measures to secure well, the, the border, that's a non-starter. Just, just quickly, the deal would not have allowed 5,000 immigrants to come into the country illegally. It would have... At a certain point, once a certain number of migrants were being processed, would have allowed the border to be shut and, and down. So not, and, and they that, wouldn't have allowed that, them to just come in illegally. Coming into and, the country, processing but, to the country, those right. are semantical phrases. But, the reality is it's an overwhelming number for the American the question, people. We can't do that. The question, I guess, is why not do something? If this is such a crisis mm -hmm. at the southern border, why wouldn't Republicans take this opportunity to do something, to pass this legislation? And just to follow up with you on that, is there any 
possibility of something getting done, or are we just too close to the election? Well, a couple of things. First, House Republicans have done something. We're the only chamber that's passed a bill, H.R. 2. It is passed the House. The Senate refuses to even talk about it or debate it. So if we're going to talk about wanting to negotiate, maybe it's time for the White House to look at the House's proposal and start talking and negotiating from mm -hmm. that perspective. As you know, H.R. 2 is a non-starter in the Senate, and even Mexico but said the they Senate, won't work but with the Senate, you on it. But the Senate bill was a non-starter in the House, so you let can't me, have it both ways. Let me ask you this just quickly before I let you you go. I know that Speaker Johnson had encouraged you all to show decorum mm -hmm. in the chamber tonight. There were some outbursts. How did you view this? Did you think there was enough decorum in the chamber tonight? How do you assess how your colleagues Well, look, it was very hard for a lot of members to maintain decorum when the president just repeatedly lied about his own record. And when there was, when this speech was partisan, it was not designed to unite the country. It was not designed to actually talk about the State of the Union. It was designed to launch his presidential campaign. Members didn't want to sit there for that. And so you had some outbursts, yes. And you didn't have a problem with that? with the outburst. Listen, at this point, we just want solutions for the country, and that did not occur tonight. All right, Congressman Byron Donalds, good to see you in person. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. And still to come, divided government, Biden's reelection pitch, and the long, long road to a presidential rematch, our political pros, join us next. You're watching NBC News Now special State of the Union coverage. administration enacted a two trillion dollar tax cut overwhelmingly benefit the top in one percent the very wealthy the biggest corporation and exploded the federal deficit they added more to the national debt than any presidential term in american history check the numbers folks at home does anybody really think the tax code is fair do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No. I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Joining me now on set are political pros, former Democratic Senator of North Dakota and CNBC contributor Heidi Heitkamp and Brendan Buck, former press secretary to House Speakers John Boehner and Paul Ryan. He is now an NBC News political analyst. Thanks to both of you for staying up late. I really appreciate it. Let me start well, I'm with a little you. wired after that yeah, speech. We so all we're are all good. a little wired at this point. We're going on midnight. What was your reaction to this speech? Do you think the president did what he needed to do? And did you like the policy more or the performance? Well, number one, I think the performance is way more important than the policy. Mm. Uh, he had to come out, he had to be vigorous, he had to be clever, he had to be responsive. But you know, what this was, was the beginning of the campaign. There's no doubt about it. And there was a lot of discussion, would he come out and do a kumbaya, let's all get mm -hmm. together? Or will he come out and basically, you know, acquit his, his case for four more years? And he went out there and acquitted his case for four more years. But I want to make this point, and I, and I think um, one of your guests earlier, it might have been Andrea, starting with Ukraine, I thought was very interesting. Mm. And I think it was done that way because he knows how critically important it is to get aid. He knows how critically important it is to get the public behind it. And I think leading with that and talking about our legacy of leadership uh, was, an, was maybe a little head bow to John McCain, his dear friend. Mm. What do you make of that, Brendan? What were your key takeaways? 
Well, I think going into this speech, we thought, okay, how does he balance the idea of firing up the base and also opening up a hand to those, maybe those Nikki Haley voters, yes. those independents? You can just sort of scratch the last one. He basically said, we're, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to focus on the base. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that's fine to, to kind of pick something, because maybe doing both probably wouldn't work out very well. And was obviously very confrontational with Republicans. Um, we talk a lot about decorum. I think Republicans should probably realize that that is not a good play. It, it, clearly, the president, when he's standing up there, has all of the structural advantages. He's able to own those uh, those back and forths. Happened last year, happened again this time. Hopefully, <laughs> next time they'll learn their lesson <laughs> that you don't win when the president is standing up there. Um, I, I think that was a very notable moment. Yeah. But, but I think they also don't they expect him to do that because they believe their own narrative that he's yeah. not capable. Yeah. And what he proved tonight is he's totally capable of holding a stage. And then when he does it, he flashes the Biden smile and it's disarming. And so he's got some mad skills. He, he demonstrated them tonight. I, I think what is so effective about those moments is the fact that he looks very in command. Mm -hmm. And it's arguably one of the strongest counterpoints, Brendan, to the criticism that he doesn't have the stamina for another four Yeah, months. I think what Chuck said earlier is, is really important. In a normal, if we're writing on a normal scale, this was not the smoothest delivery of a speech. He stumbled numerous times over words, uh, had to stop himself. But we have set expectations so low for this man that if he got through the speech, it was a success. And that's really what, what, what we saw. I think strategically, also, he did something. He's been kind of trying to figure out how he wants to deal with the age issue, yeah. Senator. And tonight, he took it head on. He, yeah. Yes, he made his jokes about it. But he also embraced the fact that I used to be called the youngest yes. person here. Now I'm the oldest. Um, he really addressed this issue head on. Well, and I, and I think he had to give a nod to it. He had to say, yes, I recognize that you may have this image, but I've got the experience. We live in a dangerous time. You want me at the helm. And and I think I think it worked. It worked because it was infused with that humor. Mm. And when you hear that and you say, oh, yeah, he gets it. He gets that people are thinking. But, you know, will this stop the discussion? He kind of threw a little, little uh, punch at uh, the age of Trump. You know, when he did it, right, he said, right, right. And, and, and my ideas are new and his ideas are old and he's as old as I am. I th the, the fact that he was going after Trump so directly was was stunning. Yeah. And it, it, it occurred to me, it, it is, we've never really had a situation where the State of the Union, the president already knew who his opponent yeah, was going that's a to great be. Point. Yes. At this point. And so the fact that it, it, you know, we had a lot of conversation. How is he going to draw the contrast during the campaign? This is an official address. How does he like raise Trump? He just went right at it and said, I'm, you know, not by name, but said my predecessor many, many times. Yeah. Um, it's just not something that we're used to in, in that setting. But this is brand new, too, because he's running against a former president of the United States. Yeah. And there is so much there. And remember what he did after the Ukraine. He talked about the insurrection. Mm. to remind everyone Second what point that he difference brought up. Yep. Yeah, it, it was really striking. The other moment that stood out to me was when he held up the pin that Marjorie Taylor Greene had given him. She said, say her name, referring to Lake and Riley. He did say her name. He did... Uh, he didn't get her first name 100 yeah. percent right, but he did say her name. She's, of course, the Georgia nurse who was um, killed by uh, an undocumented immigrant. What was what did you make of that moment and how it will play? I think if he had ignored it, it would have been a huge mistake. Mm. He had to say her name and he had to acknowledge what ha what her family had been through. And, you know, we know that if you said write the campaign ad that's going to be running over and over, it's going to be her name. Mm. And so he had to deal with it. And I thought he did very well because he was challenged by her. He picked up the pin and said, I feel horrible for her family. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brendan, what did you make of it and, and broadly of his yeah. argument on uh, to Congress that basically trying to paint them as a do-nothing Congress. It's something that Harry Truman did. Frankly, it's something that former President Obama did in his re-election campaign. Sure. And it, it's a tried-and-true yeah. tactic. I mean, on immigration in particular, Republicans clearly put this up on a tee for him to whack. You know, we, they, we had members of Congress literally saying out loud, we're not doing this because we don't want to give Joe Biden a win. And, and that's the perfect opportunity to run against Congress, and, and he took it. Um, 
I think it's interesting that you say it was a really good idea to to, to say her name. Mm. I, I think I agree with that. It w but it was more of an ad lib than anything else. And the fact that he was able to pivot in real time yeah. in that way, that's that was me. That was the moment of the night. That's the thing we're I going agree. to remember. I agree. Um, I agree. And look, if you were talking about contrasting with Congress, if you're going to pick a fight with anybody in that chamber, yeah, it's probably Marjorie so Taylor Greene you want to pick a fight with. And, and, and think about it. Had she not heckled him he wouldn't have had that moment. That's right. right. And so it didn't benefit her yeah. at all. I mean, or the in Congress. some ways, everybody gets what they want. She she got clicks and, you know, right. people talking about right. her. That's all that matters to right. her. And, and, but it, 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 to me, I, if we, you know, years from now, we're not going to remember anything he talked about, but perhaps we'll that, that one that standoff moment. with Marjorie Taylor Greene. I yeah. do have to ask you both uh, about what you heard tonight on the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The fact that he talked about the fact that he's working to get more aid into Gaza, it, it highlights, though, this real divide within the Democratic Party, with yeah. some Democrats saying you've got to get tougher on I, Israel. I think, I think anything short of calling tonight for a, ce to a permanent ceasefire was not going to satisfy the mm -hmm. protesters in front mm -hmm. of the White House. I think that's right. Brendan, what do you think and how potent of an issue is this for President Biden with his base? Yeah, obviously the senator understands this better than I do. But the fact that you have people protesting your own president on the way to their State of the Union is a huge red flag that they need to be seriously paying attention to. What, what about these numbers in this protest vote in Michigan? We saw 100,000. I mean, in a state that close, that yeah, could make I, a difference. But that doesn't mean those 100,000 aren't, right. I mean, what's their choice? We, they're running against a president, a uh, former president who would do something much more dramatic. Yeah. Hey, I mean, obviously I, you, you can let people take fire at you or you can draw a contrast. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's really where you're gonna win the yeah. argument. All right, thank you thank both you for this for great us. conversation. Really appreciate it, Heidi Heidkamp and Brendan Buck. Fantastic to be with you. And thank you for being here on a special night. We will have more analysis of tonight's address and the state of the 2024 presidential race on Meet the Press Now. This concludes NBC News Now special coverage of the 2024 State of the Union Address. Tonight, President Biden on the state of our union. The president sent to address a bitterly divided Congress, outlining the challenges facing Americans at home and abroad. The war in Ukraine now at a critical crossroads while